This episode is dedicated to my friend John's cat, Juju. May he rest in peace. He was a chunky little fellow, just like John. Okay, so here's the record that's straight. Uh, initially, the, the hotels hired hunky-looking college boys who were like 20-ish or so. And part of it was to keep the young mommies occupied. All right, we've heard enough now, okay? This is this is going beyond explicit. Oh, no, no. no, I got to hear this. I got to hear this. <laughs> the young mommies, and, and, and to, to, to a degree, dirty dancing, I, it was, the, the truth of it was that, that yeah, you had, you had a hunky-looking staff to keep the female guests occupied. And, and, and you, can, you can take that word occupied and present it any number of ways. And you're, and you're uh, not ruling out any particular way that anyone's mind wanders when presenting this no, no, in not at all. And ways. I, I can talk again, and I, I go back to, 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 the, uh, to the, the paper that I wrote. Uh, and I'll give, you, I'll give you, for example. The, the one that was conveniently destroyed or yeah, lost. The one that was, <laughs> but I remember it pretty vaguely, pretty clearly. <laughs> uh, basically, you know, what happened was when, when I, I titled it, The Brooklyn Boys Marry the Best Girls, the rest of it was, and they got married, and 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 instead of making out in the in, in the back seat or the front seat of the cars, or as my father said, you see now why single men should never buy cars with bucket seats. You know, which was my my, my <laughs> macho. My The bushwhacks were some of uh, the worst days I've ever had in the mountains, or life, really. Whereas Panther Mountain is totally opposite, it's a mountain on top of a crater. I think the weather challenges on this incident were particularly difficult. It was really the development of New York State. Catskills were responsible. Listening to Inside the Line, the Catskill Mountains Podcast. All right. All right. So, welcome to episode 118 of Inside the Line, the Catskill Mountain Podcast. Sorry. Tonight, Peter Chester reminisces about his unforgettable experiences, colorful tales from the heyday of the Borscht Bell era. And we also chat about some upcoming uh at this time of recording that has already happened april winter storm uh the lack of winter here out east but the massive winter out west and the solar eclipse which is going to be absolutely phenomenal and uh of course a little little dose of catsco mountains uh rescue on wittenberg mountain that i just got informed about today so uh welcome to the show guys uh, i hope you're doing well on this uh Really weird, weary, rainy day up here. I, I had an Oneonta. What do you guys got going on down there? How about you, Peter? Uh, the same thing. You know, we uh, it's been raining and raining, and they're predicting some snow. Uh, nobody panics up here anymore. Uh, the old timers, like myself, I remember one Memorial Day. We call it Decoration Day at Grand Mountain, where I, where I worked for many, many years. Uh, we had snow. We woke up uh, one Saturday morning. It was about three inches of snow on the ground. So of course, you know, everybody was panicking. <laughs> God, you know, what are we going to do? It was it was gone by ten o'clock, as I expected to be. Uh, you know, if, if we get anything on Thursday, but it's uh, one of those damp, dreary, uh, damp, dreary days when uh, back in the back in the hotel era, we'd see a movie or sit in the lobby or uh, you know put on the sweatshirts. Uh, nice. You know, over the- Tad, what about you? What's going on down there? More of the same. More of the same. Lots of rain. Everything's wet thinking about the snow this weekend yeah so uh of course we we uh most of us who knows the catskills we have a winter storm coming tuesday through thursday within the catskill mountains the higher peaks we're re- going to be receiving 10 to 20 inches of snow up here in the oneonta area we're only predicting one to three inches of snow you know tad i don't know about you down down, down towards the south or what they're predicting uh, up there down to the lower elevation here in the Hudson Valley, they're just mainly calling for rain. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Catskill High Peaks are going to be receiving some amazing, probably heavy snow. I'm guessing this is heavy since it's rain and stuff. It's not fluffy. Good stuff. So 
you know, if you're getting out this weekend, it's going to be uh, snowshoeing season again because we are going to be getting some heavy. It's been such a crazy on and off season, you know. Uh, Peter, I don't know what you can say about, you know, I, I'm 40 years old. I, can, I can't remember a time of where we would have rain, snow, sunshine, rain, snow, sunshine. You know, do, do you remember these days like this? Yeah, once upon a time, I was uh, 40 years old also. Uh, <laughs> I was, I'm tickling 71. Uh, I remember some strange weather, but I never remember it being being this strange. It was always April-ish, March-ish, April-ish was always, was always unpredictable. May, May, June, it started to calm down. So the summer was kind of consistent, but, but the winter was very, very strange. And all the almanacs predicted we'd get clobbered, but... Uh, I, I, I'm kind of like an old timer. There are a few farmers left up here, and yeah. uh, one farm not too far from from, from me in uh, Calicoon by the Villa Roma, which is uh, I guess we could we can call it a Borscht Belt resort, uh, except for the fact that it's Italian run, and you know they're having pasta fagioli instead <laughs> of uh, there you go, uh, and uh, and and they tell me you know he's one of the farmers that was like this you know and okay it's going to rain today yep. Uh, he kind of said it's a lot of BS. We're going to have a strange winter, but this is this has been strange. I, I don't remember it as a kid, say, but for you know an occasional blast of snow or cold weather in May, and then many many years ago, this is going back to the nineteen early nineteen sixties. Uh, the end of the summer was always dicey, particularly for, for bungalow people because the bungalows were really really had no insulation. Uh, when you had a little bit of snow, a little bit of ice, a little bit of the mixed stuff at the end of August, uh, you know, so, so people were panicking. And we also had all wheel drive cars, uh, four, uh, rear wheel drive cars. So SUVs and all of this stuff were, uh, were unknown uh, to everybody. Yeah. Except, you know, except yeah so it's it's been a, it's been a crazy winter for us over here on the East. You know, we have, uh, places closing down you know some ski resorts closing down already and then we get this massive snowfall that that they might be opening up uh but you know uh we talk about what we've had over here which is kind of ice and snow and ice and snow and rain but over out west uh mammoth uh over in, in the california area has received over 300 inches of snow falling this season yeah, the last uh, last night, uh, what this is uh, recorded March 30th, so two nights ago, 13 inches of snow fell on Mammoth Mountain. Mammoth Mountain is probably one of the biggest ski resorts over on the West Coast besides some places in Utah. And uh, just it has been absolutely insane over there on the West Coast for them. They have gotten significant amount of snowfall, which is actually great because it's going to supply the reservoirs and stuff for the, the rain and uh, thunderstorms, you know, could be happening once again uh, over in the lower elevation area, but in the higher elevation area, two to three feet of snow could happen uh, above 6,000 feet. And it's just, it's been going, once again, you you, you can't like remember uh, of this happening. You know, we used to have constant snow or, or nothing, but it was usually just constant snow and now, you know, last season over in california we had a severe drought and there was forest fires and everywhere and now look at the, this season 300 inches of snow i remember you know something about in utah received uh i, I forgot how much snow they get they received uh, an amazing amount of snow and the lines are are just galore for the for these areas and uh, you know i don't blame them you want to catch the snow while you have it you know, we had it that was last year the year before when they had uh six or seven feet up in uh buffalo at that end of the i mean the north country always gets clobbered uh and, and i remember a friend of mine who, who lives in west henrietta which is not too far from buffalo saying to me you know they had to actually dig get loaders that were in garages to dig out the loaders that were not those, those big the big ones where you've got you know that you, you're talking about something that itself is seven or eight feet tall <laughs> yeah. so, where they could just clear, just clear the throughway and the, the northern part of the throughway. It just looked like you were going through the tunnels through the Swiss Alps, where you would see these walls of snow on, on either side. We had that here. I think it was in 19, 1995 or nineteen ninety six. 
uh, I lived not too far from Monticello Raceway, so that that route they pushed the snow to the side, and it was it was the same thing. You know, you couldn't see part of the racetrack from the roadside because the piles of snow were they're, they're so high. And then it would it would stop, then it would start, and it was hell for the road crews. And, and they know what they're doing here, but nonetheless, you know, keeping up with it, and just when you're done clearing the road, you turn around and go over again. Uh, yeah. Tad, what are your thoughts about this crazy winter season? I think it's become the, the new norm, these marginal winters where we have these oscillations between winter as we knew it and winter as we're coming to know winter. So I wouldn't recommend going out and buying shares of stock in Disney, which just bought Vail Resorts. Uh, doesn't seem doesn't seem like all that good of an investment. And I I've frankly given up my skis for a pair of snowshoes, which I hope to use more than occasionally in the Catskills, and hopefully this coming weekend. No, yeah, right? You know, we 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 might have the chance. You know, hopefully. We we've seen you know you know Peter this is I would say this is more of a, a hiking podcast but I love do, doing history uh, once in a great while and we haven't done a, a podcast uh, a history lesson uh, about the Borscht Belt since episode four so it's it's been a long time coming but you know snowshoes has been a snowshoeing is an absolute phenomenal time to uh, once again connect with nature and to feel the the beauty of winter and such and you know you had kind of like the the times of that during the borscht belt era when they had the ski resorts on the the sides of the borscht belt when they on the museum not the museums but the uh the hotels that they had the fake snow that was first brought in and it was absolutely phenomenal it was uh, i can segue into that and the whole hiking thing is interesting uh <clears throat> the seasonal hotels didn't have to deal with uh unless passover was early which was you know which was the 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 bane of everyone's existence, particularly in the smaller hotel that we call 250 resorts that were not very well heated. And uh, the, the guests would stay in the dining room, not only for the meals, but for the shows and everything else, because it turned out to be the warmest place. But the larger hotels, uh, Grossinger's, uh, as early as, as the 1930s, started experimenting not only with artificial snow, but with coloring the, the, the snow. Oh, wow. So you would have uh, Concord followed suit and some of the other places. So you could have you could be be skiing and the sidebars of skiing up here in the Borscht Belty Catskills in Sullivan was never very good. Uh, we have one one big one here, Holiday Mountain, that uh, this uh, local local entrepreneur, this fellow Mike Taylor, who owns a uh, a fuel company up here, just rehabilitated and and he you know he he had a a pretty good first season, but it was actually a month short on either end because of the, the weather conditions. But the larger hotels uh, had had snowshoeing. Uh, they had uh, they had uh, there was a luge run at uh, at Grossinger's. Uh, there was a lot of cross country skiing on on the golf courses uh, of, of the hotels. So you had that with the larger places that were open that were open all year long. Uh, in addition to having an indoor heated indoor swimming pool and and ice skating and, and, and all of that stuff. So, uh, but but hiking. Hiking was interesting because even in the warmer weather, uh, hiking was 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 a way of life for for the, uh, the vacationers who came up here. One, they came up from the city where, you know, it, it's it's nice to take a walk uh, on the streets of Brooklyn, but it's not what you would call a hike. So, you know, here they could they, they could they could hike. They could they could not only walk on the country roads, uh, uh, they they could go off the country roads. They could walk across the, the fields. Uh, Hiking to Mountaindale was was uh, was was interesting because uh, you, it would take you longer than it normally would because you know you'd go off the, the the country road you'd pick berries you'd look at the wildlife and the sidebar was you know the the, the dangerous forms of wildlife the the bear the snakes uh, deer and, 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 and the critters as we call them the skunks and the raccoons were always there but 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 it, it was almost like that generation didn't care about it it was the just the exhilaration of of breathing uh, the fresh air, uh, or, or Yiddish frische Luft, which is the fresh air, the reason people came up here. Uh, so hiking was it was it was a, a, an interesting attraction for the smaller hotels that didn't have the, the smaller hotels that didn't have the uh, that didn't have the indoor pools, you know, that didn't have the ice skating rinks, that didn't have all of the indoor 
activities uh, that the larger places had. So hiking, hiking, berry picking, uh, for the smaller hotels, for the bungalow colonies, uh, more so, more so for the for the adults. Although we we used to have it at uh, the place I was at before I started working there, uh, we used to have the annual hike from Greenfield Park to Ellenville. Oh wow! Was, uh, nice. We didn't go along the highway. We went. We went up some old country roads. It was safer, uh, you know. And then we would, we would stray and we would look at, at you know different wildlife and things that a lot of the kids uh, who grew up in, in the city never saw because you know while Prospect Park in Brooklyn and Central Park are very nice, it's not the same kind of same kind of country layout that you have up here. True. Yeah. And, uh, you know, coming across the, the hiking stuff, you know, we want it's, 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 it's brought into a whole different perspective now in, in this era. And now we have hikers going on, on the big summits and stuff like that. Now we have incidences. And, uh, today I was just brought upon this incident, uh, from the, the Rangers, uh, perspective. And, uh, we had this in the, recently which was march 31st two days ago uh in the town of shandaken uh ray book dispract received a call from the hiker reporting they have fallen down a rock face near the summit of cornell mountain now cornell mountain is one of the uh 3500 peaks it's a, it's around 3800 3900 feet uh over in the burrows range and uh, they suffered an ankle injury now due to the severity of the injury and the location forest rangers the uh new york state police aviation uh required some assistance and uh ranger martin who uh, has been on the show has been a awesome guy uh he spoke to the 64 year old hiker who had indicated she had splinted her ankle and would walk towards the wittenberg mountain so uh once again, the Rangers and the woman kind of worked together with this. And uh, the New York State Police Pilot Sergeant Plishus, uh, Plishus, that's a tough name to, to say, flew Rangers Stratton and Horn to the area, which was probably, uh, I'm guessing by the picture, uh, was the summit of, of and the viewpoint of Wittenberg Mountain. And they uh, assisted them so the Ranger Horde could get the hikers secured in a hoist rescue. Uh, following the successful hoist, the four Rangers hiked up to Wittenberg Mountain from Woodland Valley to assist the hiker's husband to his vehicle. So they went down. Uh, this started all at 1.45 p.m. and ended at 5.30 p.m. where they uh, were all cleared out. So four-hour rescue. Awesome. They have this online, probably at any social media area of the hoist rescue off of Wittenberg Mountain. It looks like a beautiful day. So awesome job by the Rangers once again on Wittenberg Mountain, who for the last couple of years, we had several rescues on there and uh, the search and rescue team was called out a couple of times to there, but they've unfortunately uh, needed the the New York State Police to help out in the aviation rescues because it's just too much of a haul to bring someone down that four miles from the top of Wittenberg Mountain. And uh, God, those, those, uh, those Rangers and the state police have been kicking ax all year long, so. Yeah. They're, they're remarkable. It's interesting to just to scroll it back. Before uh, my family, my, my parents were Holocaust survivors. Uh, so the first trip was not to this type of horse belt. Uh, we went to uh, a place in, in Begindian. So I'm, I'm familiar with Shandaken and uh, all that's over there. I mean, we we, we, we would hike. Uh, you know, I, mean, I, was, I was a little kid, but my, my parents liked to do it. And, you know, when you think about it, you didn't have that type of, that type of, of patrol available there yeah so you 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 had you had your hiking stick you had your hiking stick you, you may have had some flares and even then you didn't have it uh cell phones of course were, were unheard of uh but those mountains are those mountains are incredible i mean they when they uh when they put the uh, water tunnel which uh, bacon uh, came from uh, the ashokan reservoir uh, they they changed the landscape of that you know significantly so the uh that and the whole area around Sophus creek so so the the pitches and the terrain and then the 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 consistency of of, of the land itself so you know you could you could walk and, and I, I i'm not an avid hiker but i i've done some hiking many years ago uh and and they're they're telling you that just you know be careful where you're walking right because they look consistent but you know due to you know due to what was done with infrastructure uh you know, it, it changed significantly, but 
the, the state police and, and the, the, uh, the, 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 the local gentry who are responsible for safety of hikers are just incredible. I mean, they do this, you know, even the most difficult of situations, they're able to, to do this in, in, in record time. Yeah. So, so. Phenomenal stuff. So, uh, once again, thank you to, uh, anybody and anybody who participated in this, uh, rescue event, uh, in any rescue events, right? It's just phenomenal. So, uh, once again, thank you to the monthly supporters, Chris, Darren, Vicky, John, Betsy, Denise, Vanessa, Joseph, Jim, Michael Bongner, David Mead. Uh, love you guys. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Also, congratulations on Vicky Ferrer for receiving her LNT or leave no trace certificate. Uh, also check out our sponsors, uh, Outdoor Chronicles Photography, Molly from Outdoor Chronicles Photography, specializes in adventure elopement and adventure couple photography in the Catskills, Adirondack, and White Mountains. She is an officiant for getting married, but she is also a licensed guide, but she is also a story maker. Molly won't just give you photos, she'll give you memories that will last forever. Don't hesitate to get a hold of Molly on all platforms. Also, have you ever wanted to more, learn more about hiking or backpacking or even just brush up on some of your old skills in the backcountry? Check out Trail Bomb Project, a hiking and backpacking school located in New Jersey. Scott and Joe from the New Jersey Search and Rescue Team have amazing background in Wilderness First Aid, Wilderness First Responder, and the Mountain Rescue Association, and they are here for you to learn old and new skills of hiking and backpacking. They teach anything from first aid, map and compass, and many other skills that could help you and others out in the trail. Check them out on their social media websites and all platforms. So, uh, you guys drinking anything tonight? Uh, Peter, what are you having tonight? Anything? Oh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be a good boy. I had a, uh, heart valve implant several months ago. So I, I've got to curve back on, on some of the, uh, the locally produced stuff, which is, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm cheating I'm, every, every day that I'm getting closer to the, to the, uh, <laughs> line where the doctor says, okay, you can resume. I got to give you the company line. Don't do it, but I'm going to give you the real line. Just, just, you know, ease your way back into it. So I'm down to, uh, to my essential water because they told me among other things, as I trek on to the seventh decade of my existence, that, my blood chemistry is a little bit too acidic, so I should be drinking uh, <laughs> pH uh, alkaline water. So, yeah, so we're doing that, but but we're we're pretty good for the time being. Good call, Tad. What about you, sir? Stewart's. I'm sticking with the, I'm sticking with the usual cup of fresh brewed coffee to keep me to keep me up so I can get through this tonight. Oh God! I, I'd, yeah. I'd love to have a hot bowl of borscht in front of me. That's what I'm really hankering uh, for, but we're going to hear all about that, I suppose, Peter. Well, I'm, I'm going to. While we're talking about borscht, I, I can't. I, I can't develop a taste for the stuff. Hot, cold. I can't look at it. I can't smell it. <laughs> it, it doesn't. Doesn't. Die. And I've, I've had every everything from from uh, uh, mothers in the jar to homemade stuff made by 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 real Russian Coptic Christians who trace their ancestry back to whenever i just can't develop a taste so, so right i'm just bringing up stash i think we need to stop this whole podcast <laughs> right here if 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 peter is not a connoisseur of borscht what is he doing on the uh, show what i mean peter uh, seriously you have the borscht belt museum shirt on but you're telling us you're you're basically a fake that's what i'm hearing are you really yeah, a I, I, I i i really am uh i can i can make the stuff uh, I, I can, I, I'm told that when I make it and I've done it at the hotel, it's pretty good. Uh, I think part of it is, is because my first, my next to, next to the, uh, we, we are, we're all adults next to the, the well, smell speak for of the yourself. Bathroom. There you go. Well, sometimes <laughs> I mean, it's still an 18, year, still an 18 year old, uh, uh, in, in front of me, uh, the, the, although the hormones are not working as they once were. We, we don't have uh, to go there, Peter. And, and no, we're going to, we'll, we'll keep it. We'll 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 keep it clean. Uh, the second the second most annoying odor that I uh, smelled in the, in the Catskills was the uh, the smell of the boiling of the beets that started shortly before the Fourth of July, and this was a seasonal hotel called Grand Mountain, the Greenfield Park, where I spent most of the time. In those days, uh, everything was really freshly made. The, uh, the the hotel had Hillcrest Farm attached to it, so this was one of those those real 
Jewish farmers uh, takes in guests in the 19 room farmhouse and then builds bungalows and builds a hotel and the hotel morphs into into a resort and a country club. Uh, so so the, the lingering, the, the smell of the, the beats was, <laughs> was in the kitchen, it was in the dining room. Uh, you know, and that combined with the, uh, the occasional smell coming from the septic tanks made for an interesting, <laughs> interesting combination. But but with, with the issue of divorce, I you know I I, I may I just I tasted it. It just doesn't it just doesn't do anything for me. But although uh, I, I can drink shop, which is which we call grass juice, which is a green concoction, uh, I I, uh, I I do recall very fondly that the overwhelming majority of the, the guests wanted their borscht uh, cold. Uh, they wanted it either served in in in, in what we call the water glass. Uh, or they had it in the glass and they poured it into a like a cereal bowl with a boiled potato, and uh, there was a dollop of uh, of sour cream that was that was that was put inside and it would be stirred together. In some of the pictures, if, if you see the the glass, you can see some of the the white dots, which is sour cream floating floating around it. Uh, I, I I have tasted it. I tasted tasted cold borscht, hot borscht. Uh, in between borscht uh, with boiled potatoes, uh, so so I guess I guess if that would make me the fraud, I I, I, I own up to it. <laughs> We're just being you know, honest I, here. Well, you know, it, I, I I I do own I do own up to it. the uh, the other delicacies up here. I, I, I am very 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 fond of you know from, from the gefilte fish, which was homemade, the chopped liver, every, everything. You know, let me just scroll it back. All of this stuff back in the day, at my day actually began when I was old enough to understand what it's all about when my parents trekked from Big Indian to uh, to the Borscht Belt and Catskills. You know, I was I was brought up on that because of, of, of the German Jewish background. Uh, we ate all of this stuff. Uh, not particularly good for the arteries, but you know, it, <laughs> it, was, uh, it tasted very good. So all of these things were uh, were foods that my, my now grandchildren look at me and say, uh, you know, pop, pop, pop googling gefilte fish and it doesn't look like a fish you know i said no that's because there's no such thing as a gefilte fish that's you know so so you know this, this is all second nature to me but you know in the hotels all of this was freshly yeah definitely including, including, farm, farm to table yeah you know when they talk about farm to table and i had this discussion with with uh, uh some of the, the the people who who've uh resettled up here some many since covid but but a number before that farm to table was the, the backbone and and in fact one of the great attractions of coming to coming to the hotels. So everything was farm to table, uh, everything from the cheese to the milk, uh, to all the vegetables, to all the fruits. Uh, the, the only the only kind of fruit and vegetable that 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 was not farm to table were those that you couldn't grow up here. The the, the chickens, uh, while they weren't free range per se. Uh, the, the, the chicken farmers would let them out of the poops into into a, a, a penned in yard and just throw out the feed because it was easier to do that than to go from from each each confined area within the coop. So farm to table, you know, I, I used to say, uh, you know, I, I was very much turned on by Hillcrest Farm. So when I was a little kid, I was milking cows. I mean, I was one of the few kids in the city and, and I can still do it, by the way, I do very well. <laughs> Another thing that my grandchildren stayed away from me. Yeah, was, right. Hmm. You know, speaking of farms table, uh, I got a a Rev Spirits. Oh, what is it? Oh, cherry baby, uh, eight point five percent alcohol. It's cherry vanilla mead. It's absolutely phenomenal. Pretty, pretty, pretty kick ass. Pretty, pretty you know, fancy. Yeah, I mean, we didn't. You know, the 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 uh, the local breweries are a relatively new invention. Although, uh, you know, Royal Kedem Winery. Uh, has been in the Hudson River Valley in Highland, which is not too far from from where you are, home of uh, Floyd Patterson, the boxer. You know, Royal Kedem, Royal Kedem does everything there from, from harvest the grapes to press the grapes to bottle the wine to to put labels on it that says bottled especially for Tamarack Lodge or a Concord of Rosingers and uh, and and send them out send them out to the hotels. Uh, the other stuff, uh, you know. The, the beer and the other stuff was, you know, usual Jenny Cream Ale and Schlitz and, and hey, Jenny Cream Ale, baby. 
I happened to like Jenny Cream Ale. I mean, I went to SUNY Binghamton for a little while, and that was, you know, we would brush our teeth with that. So that was, <laughs> it was, it was actually pretty good. Although, I love this guy. This is, yeah, Peter's yeah. flexing on us. This guy's <laughs> flexing now. All right. He starts off, he's drinking pH balanced water or something like that. Now yeah, he's, well, I'm, now it's, I'm, it's, he, he does uh, <laughs> shots of Jenny Cream Ale, you know, his mouthwash and, it's, if it uh, were only a shot, then then yeah. it would be fun. It was, mm-hmm. like, you know, so, one, so one, I, two, one, two. So, yeah. So, Peter, I know that uh, Stosh here wants to tell us about a recent hike that uh, he was on, and and maybe a little Catskill Mountain history. So, when we get into the Catskill Mountain history, history, I wanna I wanna know where you were in August of nineteen sixty nine. But first, let's hear about Stosh's recent hike. Just to tickle you for a moment, exactly where you thought I was. I actually lived not too far from that, oh. but I didn't see it the whole time. But we can talk about that in a bit. Definitely. So uh, we talked about previous hikes. So I went up uh, and over Acro Point, And uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to rephrase this. I'm going to edit this. You know, I went up and over a mountain to look at a glider crash that is once on the east side of of the Blackhead Range area. And uh, I'm, I'm a plane crash fanatic. And I was just like, you know what? You know, screw the trail. I'm going to bushwhack. Absolutely phenomenal. Open woods going up. Uh, 20 mile per hour winds. Wind chill was beautiful. I look over on the, the range, Blackhead Range. There was snow happening on the tippy top of the peaks, probably at like 3,900. Absolutely beautiful, phenomenal, phenomenal day. I find the, the plane crash. I, I get back to the trail. I'm like, do I want to go over to the viewpoint? Yes, I absolutely do. I want to see the view of the Blackhead Range. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm number one. I love views. I, I'm a view fanatic. And uh, I just like hiking in general. I'm not a list guy. And just the whole day being out there in the wilderness with, uh, you know, one side being, you know, 20 mile per hour constant winds and you know maybe down in the low 20s was phenomenal and the other side was just absolutely excuse me absolutely no winds was just phenomenal and then flying finding the, the crash and then going back to the viewpoint uh i was just blown away and it was one of those days where you could see so far but also right at the tippy top of our peaks in the catskills were with snow squalls happening and i was just blown away i cannot hmm. there's there's a time you know where, where you're just like ah you know i didn't enjoy this but once again getting out there and uh you know like like these peoples of the borscht belt times breathing that fresh catskill mountain air god it just kills you it just feels so good so were you hiking solo 100 percent solo i'd love and this is one of the crashes you hadn't been to before? Right. Correct. One of the crashes so, this is number 27. Wow. And had you searched this area for this crash before, or was this your first time looking for it? First time. Yeah. And so how long did it take you to zero in on where it was and find it? Oh God, it was nothing. I'm a, I'm a bushwhacking fiend. And, uh, you know, if I, if I have a location, I can find it within you know, 30 minutes and, uh, you know, good friend. So, to, go when you say you had a location, did you have coordinates or just a general idea? Coordinates. I did. Really? Okay. Well, good for you. Now, is this, speaking of good for you, and maybe this is a really, really poor segue, um, did the fellow or whoever was a passenger in the glider survive? That is a question I have yet to answer. I have to ask my friend about that. And, you know, judging by the looks of the glider you know i don't you probably saw some orders now uh, peter i'm going to send you a photo really quick i'm pretty sure that uh he did survive judging by the the glider look of the crash because it was uh it looked there's only number one one wing that was detached and uh i was surprised uh by how far you could kind of go into the forest with a, a glider i when i saw it from a distance i was just like could that be it 
and uh you know the reflection of course of the of the glider it, and i was i was blown away i was like wow there's still a huge wing those wings got to be at least 20 to 25 feet wide and there was only one wing missing and, and it looked like kind of like the uh the the area where the he would be hanging from or, or gliding from was intact and you know i was i was kind of blown away uh hmm. peter so, i just sent you this to the, your email so check that out and do you know where this guy or the the pilot had taken off from in the glider you know i i don't have any previous information i gotta ask my hmm. friend joe about that that's interesting so do you know whether or not um the federal aviation safety board does a review or investigation of glider crashes or is that just motorized aircraft um you with a glider you have to have an aviation certification for that so mm -hmm. you do have an aviation number there is actual number on the wing for that mm -hmm. and and does the safety board investigate those crashes as well or not uh, I know they, they do. do an investigation yeah so it'd be interesting I'm sure you're going to look for that safety report to get more of the backstory on what happened yeah with respect it's, uh, to that crash so yeah. while you're looking while you're looking for that I did get out um with Danny Davis over the weekend we weren't peak bagging uh we had a very interesting hike up one of the coves in the Catskills I learned a lot more about the geology and the forces that shape the Catskill Mountains and what was interesting is the week before I wish almost wish I had my snowshoes with me this past weekend no show no snowshoes no spikes required and who knows what you'll need this coming weekend snowshoes spikes all of the above he survived I think he survived it's it's crazy so we'll get uh Peter's uh thought about that in a little in a, in, a, in a little bit when he sees it so once again Catskill Mountain News volunteer definitely always volunteer 3500 Cope Catskill Trail Crew Catskill Mountain Clubs Visitor Center Valley Jolly Rovers Trail Crew uh Bradley Mountain Fire Towers looking for some volunteers uh up towards me you know that's tough I actually got a e or uh a text message from oh god eric friedman who is uh of the catskill mountain trail crew and he said he was listening to the later podcast and he they're heading up to the terrace mountain lean to on four five which is april 5th to april 7th to finish up some stone patio started it also looks like they have uh been doing some stuff on friday mountain as well uh which is weird i find that a little weird because that is bushwhack the dec put approvals for the 2024 projects um their events can be found on the the trail conference website uh, under get involved so check them out catskill trail crew definitely doing some amazing work around the catskills once again us all coming together and working together can improve our trails out here in the catskills and that's basically why i'm doing this podcast it's just to get us all united and to uh for us to kick ass and the cat skills and uh i also do this podcast about history sorry peter you know so it's like history trail come you know back and forth well i'm, I'm looking at this interesting uh you know i only see part of the fuselage and, and i'm thinking um he either he either jumped out before it hit the <laughs> ground or it, it it doesn't look like there would be a survivor because i'm looking at, at where the uh I've actually flown, been in gliders here at Wurtsboro, uh, not recently. Wow. Uh, one of the most exhilarating experiences, if you're familiar with that area, because you've got the uh, the, the ridge, the Schwangen Ridge, that's uh, surrounding you. Uh, and, and they've been doing that for a very long time. It's a big, big appeal. Uh, and it, I remember the first time I did it, it was like, you know, you, you like tap. I said, wait a minute, this 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 thing doesn't have any wheels on it. Because, <laughs> you know. What are you doing? I'm telling you what the what the plane is feeling when it hits the ground. Uh, so again, assuming it's under some kind of control, this looks this this looks pretty damaging. Yeah, it's it's, it's definitely a, a controversial topic because you know the, the way the the area are kind of like the 
the landing was and stuff like that. So who knows? I I, I sent my message friend uh, or my my friend a message, and we'll see what he, what he comes up with with this uh, with this report because I know he's done his background check. So you know, talk about the, uh, the the hiking. One of the big initiatives, and uh, you're aware of it, uh, is the rails to trails uh, that that happens in Sullivan County. Uh, it, it kind of masks the stupidity of uh, of getting rid of rail service, which back in its day that actually predates me. I, I remember the rights of way. I remember seeing some old some old relics of the Ontario and Western that uh, you know, it was all it was all steam locomotives. Uh, it's a little little bit of diesel service, but also steam. And it was an interconnect system. It was interesting because a lot of the a lot of the small towns up here actually had trolley service that that interconnected them. But in Sullivan, you had the O and W Railway, so you know you could you could get on that train in Mountaindale and go into place else within Sullivan. You could go, you could actually go up to Calicoon and take a train that would take you almost up to Binghamton. So when they uh, when they started to to tear up the right of way, uh, it, it sat dormant for many many years until I'm going to say tenish years ago when people said, "Well, these are great hiking trails." Because the, the the roadbed of the railroad railroad is is, is fairly flat, it, it, it could lend itself to you know it would lend itself to a nice comfortable hike. So they they've uh, the idea is to to have you go basically from the station in Mountaindale all the way on through and and eventually wind up in Hurleyville, which would follow most of the pathway. The ones that you, you couldn't, of course, is where they had where they had the bridges. Uh, there, there was a, a tunnel, the tunnel in Wordsboro tunnel that goes actually. The Highview Tunnel that goes from, from Highview, which is right before Wordsboro, and Highview because uh, it's it's a higher elevation and one of the iconic hotels, the uh, Tawanda Lodge, uh, is, is up there. So the, the story of that tunnel is that the uh, the tunnel was built by was was built as most of them were by 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 hand, uh, and and they came in from both. They they didn't have sophisticated boring uh, uh, equipment, so they came in from two sides. And the story, and it was fact checked, is that they were off like like a foot. <laughs> wow! In, uh, hmm. in, in with respect to the uh, the illustrious Second Avenue subway in Manhattan, <laughs> where when they couldn't they, they somehow couldn't figure out how to make it watertight when it with all the technology how they couldn't make it watertight when they eliminated the, uh, hmm. the East River. So, so this thing, and I mean parts of it is still there. They they they've got. Part of it boarded up. It's not particularly safe, but I, I've walked into a little bit of it. It's just amazing to, to see that. And, and this thing, you know, it, it, it just about fit the, the steam locomotives that, that went through it. Uh, you know, of course, you know they tell you to to, to roll the windows up because otherwise you'd be you'd, you'd be, be covered with soot. But but they did wonderful things with that hiking trail, and, and they you know they put some historic markers along the way. And uh, the, the long range idea is to is to have it so that you would be able to have a link on your phone uh, that would that would give you the the, the tour of what you would be seeing, yeah. uh, which, which is a, a nice idea. It, it certainly mm. took them long. Definitely, to, 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 it took them. In fact, it took them. I'm going to be snarky. It took them way too long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, we we've come a long way, of course, uh, and. Uh, you know, talking about the rail trails. You know, we have uh, amazing rail trails here over and the Ashokan area, uh, the Hunter area, the Tannersville area, and they're connecting everything together. And it's making an absolute phenomenal uh, time for, for people who can enjoy these high peaks. You know, they can only do so much uh, to enjoy the Catskills and the Ashokan Rail Trail is absolutely phenomenal. And this, is, once again, follows the existing area of the rail trails that brought people once again from the city all the way up to Tannersville or all the way up to the, the Monticello area and, and such. So we got amazing history um, that to talk about. So let's get on to uh, quickly the, the weather aspect of this, uh, of the podcast. So uh, we usually talk about the, the weekends, but you know, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, even Tuesday tonight, you know, we're, we're supposed to receive up in the high peaks at least up to 20 inches of snow going into Thursday. Uh, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, supposed to be some clouds lingering in. But once again, 20 inches of snow up in the high peaks. This is predicted from Slide Mountain area, which is the tallest peak in the Catskills, receives the most weather in the Catskills. So you might as well be prepared 
And uh, we're going to go from 32 degrees all the way down to seven degrees with wind chills. So be prepared for anything. And I, I hate to say this, freaking everything that you can handle in the mountains, because we're going to have it within this coming five to six days uh, with, with this recording, which is on Tuesday. I like to record on Tuesday just so I can edit and, and get this done before I can uh, pass out within the time the prediction for us is, is an inch or two three inches so that however the, yeah the problem is when you when you're sitting at 31 32 33 29 and and you start to get that that funny looking funny looking mix up here that i mean they grind the roads but the reality is uh you know you, you really really shouldn't be driving when there's ice right on the roads although yeah unless you want to go bag that peak then do you ain't the city folk but it's it's you know oh i got a four by four i got a big hijacked up four by four with big tires yeah that'll slide also so instead of having the two drive tires slide you're gonna have four, <laughs> four of them Good. Got any luck, except for the fact that you know you'll slam on the brakes you won't zigzag but you keep going you keep going straight until you know the car stops or something or something stops it so uh, right it just goes the other side you know they put you know, even even the the, uh, the lawn furniture, of course, at Home Depot and the chains comes out uh, on January second. Uh, so, so if you want to get a bag, <laughs> of, uh, or even a bag of sand that that you, that you can use, it's kind of difficult. Uh, shovels and and snow blowers, you know, right? I know a little bit better. I don't. I don't. I don't clean the snow blower and pack it away until end of April yeah so um yeah so once again be prepared for anything and everything in the catskills mountain shoe uh mountain you know snowshoes mountain spikes whatever uh get ready for anything and everything um so we're gonna go into i mean we're gonna be talking about catskill mountain history but you know tad has a question for you peter about a little bit of catskill mountain history so sure i'd like you to answer this yeah. So, so Peter, I already gave you a, a little preview, but you know, it's a big part of the, the Catskills, big part of Sullivan County, uh, was the Woodstock festival in August of 1969. So with, with your background of, of being in the Catskills in the summer, I got to ask, tell us where you were August 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th of 1969. I, I was I, I was actually in Woodstock for a short period of time. I live not too far from the uh, from from the festival site. Uh, I was uh, 16, 1950. I was sixteen and a half years old. I was working at Grand Mountain, uh, you know, and it was kind of dicey because, you know, while while you could get away, you know, like Thursday ish, Friday, Friday, but getting away after that, you know, and then you know you had the lingering effects of the. Uh, of the cannabis haze that <laughs> pretty much covered pretty much covered the county actually um the, the weather was terrible the weather uh, you know the, the weather was terrible the uh yasker farm and, and there are a couple of other farms that are that are on that side of 17b it's about it's about uh 10 or so 12 miles from where i live now i'm, I'm right off of 17b uh so so we got there let's say thursday or so something like that uh, and, and the sky started to open up, so that by Friday morning, it, it, it was, you know, you were, you were sinking in the mud. Uh, unlike everybody else who came, who drove down 17B, they would get off of Route 17 and exit 104, go past the raceway. Uh, us pseudo-country folk uh, came on 55, which went past, uh, your end of 55 would go past uh, the Rondout and, and then the Never Sink, and you could from all the way around, and you could go through uh, Kanyanga Lake, uh, and and you could kind of weasel your way down, down, down to the site. Uh, there were people on top of people on top of people. Just it was just it was you know it, it was just just the, the site alone. I mean the, the site alone, and 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 the because of the the weather conditions, and it was kind of damp and, and dreary, but it was a little on the warm side. It would exacerbate the, the cloud of marijuana and uh, 
uh, an opiated hash and everything else that that was being smoked and being shared. People were very gracious. Uh, were, so, were, you, uh, were you smoking and sharing yourself, Peter? Well, I, 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 I'm going to. You don't I'm have to lie. answer that. You could start. I don't know what no, the I, statute I, of limitations is if you want to take the fifth. Yeah, well, I will, I will tell you that I, I did, but you really didn't have to because the contact high that you would get was, <laughs> uh, was correct. Just, uh, you, you would get the contact. You would get the if you if you if if you sunroofs were unknown at that in those times and, and you know most of the guys you didn't have the air conditioning had four, <laughs> five, uh, some had convertibles so you know you would start to get the contact high when you got off of uh, Route 17 the quick way at exit 104 so and as you got closer and closer uh, it was it was it was more pronounced. The, were you, were you, you know, able I, to? Did you get into the festival itself? Yeah. Yeah, I actually, I I actually had tickets. Nice, know, one of, one of the few paying customers. Well, you know, it's interesting. There were there were a number of paying customers, but because it was just so exponentially greater than they expected, uh, the sidebar to that is I had unmolested Woodstock tickets uh, that my my mother, who my God bless her, but but you know, if it, if it wasn't her junk, she was a junk lady with her own junk, but if it wasn't her junk, she get rid of it. So of course, you know, she threw out the Woodstock oh. tickets up with my unmolested case of Billy beer. Uh so needless to say, I mm. would be, you know, my biggest problem would be where to dock the yacht that she would not. Sure. Have. So for for those who don't know the reference to Billy Beer, is that uh uh President Carter's brother, Billy Carter? Yeah, and this was interesting because this was uh this was a twenty four pack of Billy Beer that was <laughs> in in the cardboard uh in the cardboard box and how was it how was it that you resisted cracking open one of those billy beers for all those I, years I, I actually i actually had some that i did drink uh it was uh it, was it as bad as the borscht soup it was it was it was about as bad as the borscht soup <laughs> it was somewhere it was somewhere in between somewhere in between flat peels and warm schlitz mm, ooh. Ooh, that's that is trash talk. <laughs> With all due respect to you know uh, what's you know what's it? Which one made Milwaukee famous? Was it Schlitz or something? One of one of those. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it, there the, the the issue the issue with Woodstock. I mean, the, because of because of the, the geography of not only the farm itself, but because of the geography of the area, you could you could hear. With a reasonable amount of clarity, you could hear the music several miles away, in oh. in, in every direction. Uh, so it it's it's it, it was it was an event. Uh, mm -hmm. Locals, I, I think the locals they're just getting over the shock of it now. Some you know, some, some, or, or they're dead. Uh, <laughs> I mean, no responsibility for for killing them, but uh, I remember I do remember a lot of them were. We're, we're sitting out on their sitting out on their porches saying where well, air smell pretty damn good here you know so yeah. uh that that part you know that that part of the county as you started to get west of Sullivan County of, of Monticello you had less less borscht belt and uh you know more more of the the, the, the locals uh and they they were completely in awe not, not not only because you know you had these crazy hippies around uh but but just the sheer number of people who are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, and and just because it's a common misconception, um, we should just make it clear that the festival itself was not in Woodstock, New York. Of course. No. Uh, so it was, yeah, it was Bethel. Yeah, it was in yeah, it was called an Aquarian Exposition in White Lake, New York. Uh White Lake is in the town of Bethel, the, the county, like 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 your neighboring county is chopped up into uh in, into townships so the, the actual site of the asker farm was was in was in bevel absolute and, uh, farm area that the area was just a, an open pasture of everything which was crazy oh, yeah and even today you know uh, the uh, bethel bethel uh wood center for the arts built on it and you know you have the, the memorial of what the stage was and uh, and all of that just that the vista alone is is magnificent yeah. to it's really part of the county that's that's unspoiled so it, it it looks the vista that you would see looking down from from where the art center is to where the uh, memorial plaque is is exactly the same as it was at that time you would just you would just see what what 
were, were just just acres and acres of, of grassland. Wow. Exactly the same, with the exception of the cannabis cloud. Yeah, the <laughs> cannabis cloud is not there anymore. Although, uh, <laughs> in, in, in Hill, I believe it is. I think they've opened a cannabis store. Uh, you know, because of, of newer ventilation, uh, net ventilation in the homes, uh, uh, the cannabis cloud. But they will never. You know, th- there's never going to be nope. a cannabis any place in the universe that's going to that's going to rival that 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 cannabis cloud. Uh, Someone who goes to like reggae festivals like me uh and, and and concerts absolutely not you know something that my parents said that they traveled up from uh massapequa in long island and gave gave like their doubt halfway through because they couldn't make it up there because of the long line of of cars they they gave up and a just just a thought of what it was back in 1969 was just absolutely it blows my mind every time to think wow as you know, those pictures you see uh, on 17B, that, that's how it was. I mean, you know, the reality is the sidebar to this is uh, I, I, I think my I think my father knew I went. But for the most part, uh, I, I was I was a kid. I mean, I was <laughs> I was I was the youngest of, uh, of the wait staff. Uh, so, you know, I was I would I would be the one that 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 they would miss. So, you know, my my instead of staying, the other guys, they, the, uh, the agreement was. I could go with them, but I would have to go back. And then they did manage to get me back the same way, because once the cars were locked in place on 17B, then there was no problem with the other highways. You know, you, you could always find a little, hmm. you know, uh, careful. And again, there were no no four by fours or nothing that you could say. Well, you know, I don't care if there's a drainage ditch on the side; my truck can get me through that. Uh, so the understanding was that my time would be finite because I would have to go back and somehow cover for for the guys until uh, and they came back Saturday ish because you would really be screwed if you would not be there hmm. Saturday. That would, wow! You know. So before we before we move along, Peter, do you remember any of the acts that played while you were there? Yeah, right. uh, Sean and I was there when I was there. Uh, uh, what's her name? John Baez was there. Uh, I'm having a brain. I'm having a brain fog. It's the residual effect. From a me. brain fog or cannabis cloud is overtaking <laughs> Peter. But when I think of it, there's still some lingering, you know, some lingering cannabis, which will mm-hmm. probably is that is that what's growing in the background over your uh, uh, right yeah, shoulder? That's actually, that's, yeah, that's actually. I, I tell everybody that that's one of the uh, Asian bamboo plants that you can buy in the malls, but that's really you know, cannabis mm-hmm. plant. Hey. Just as long, well, been, as long as you got the experience of that, uh, you know, I couldn't e- uh, imagine of, uh, like my parents said, halfway through, they, they decided to, to bail on that. And uh, just, just that, it, uh, you know, it was, it was a miracle in a sense that, that there was not a real health catastrophe uh, <laughs> with all due to, to the locals. Uh, they, they some of them were selling glasses of water for a dollar, so you know it wasn't all the love, peace, and, and everything. The, the the mess that was there was, you know, it was, it, it was again, it was because not not on purpose, because you know, while the hippie culture looked sloppy and dirty, they, they really weren't. But there was no place, you know, so you would you, your plastic garbage bags were un, unknown. They were just beginning to get the plastic garbage bags, so there was nothing to put the garbage in. And if you did have something to put the garbage in, there was no place to take the garbage to. Because again, back in those days, the, the hotels and the bungalow colonies, they would they would burn it and bury it. Oh. There was very, very little municipal sanitation. So you mm. would you would take it to, to the dump. And and if you were a resident, you know, you would buy buy passes to uh and you still have that by the way, the kind of bucket, uh where where you get you get a coupon book and, and you, you can take certain things to, to the dump. So uh, you know, in defense, there, there was. It's not that they didn't want to; they 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 didn't know how to in terms of taking it from the site yeah. and, and getting and getting rid of it. Uh, surprisingly, and and this I can't tell you firsthand. This was secondhand. Getting out of what appeared to be you know a mess that oh these cars are going to be here for, for the next ten years, they did manage to 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 you know within it it, it took 
it took uh, it took six, seven, eight, ten hours to clear the traffic. Uh, wow. You know, but, but it did. You know, it, it it did eventually. It did eventually move down. The cannabis cloud was something else. You know, we had to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Speaking yeah. of of eight to ten hours to clear the cl- the traffic, that kind of sounds like what's coming up this month, coming Monday with the solar eclipse, right? Yeah, I mean, probably going to be. I, you know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, if 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 all goes according to plan, we should we should get in the mid eighty percent of, of the eclipse. Uh, yeah, sure. And then that site on the Bethel Woods campus is is a, is a nice site for viewing, as is. Uh, uh, Monticello Raceway, which is you know, close to my house. So yeah, yeah you, you probably yeah. well. I'm going to watch it from my back backyard. I can see Stosh is nudging us along to the the next segment here. So I'm yeah. I'm heating up my borscht soup right now to get ready for it. All right, so let's get on to the the sponsors. Uh, once again, Cap Catskill. Is it time for new gear or hiking in the Catskills? Say no more. Camp Catskill in Tannersville has all your hiking needs. Footwear, socks, moisture wigging shirts, freeze dried meals, Catskill merchandise, and more. They have all the essential needs. Located in Tannersville and online, check out Camp Catskill if you want free stickers. Stop here. Also, if you're ready to hit the trails, make sure you take the scenic route. Our guides are to, here to help you with your goals, big or small, like Marcy or Slide or Low in their stores. Check out Scenic Route Guiding and Gear Rentals on Instagram and Facebook for more information. Also, if you mention the podcast, you can get 10% off. Use the code word Mountain Line. Also, check out Another Summit, a nonprofit program that leads outdoor adventure activities for veterans and first responders for free. Another Summit's epic adventure applications are open, and this year's epic adventures includes a nine-day canoe trip in the North Wayne woods and a through hike of the North Pole Plaza Trail in the Adirondack. The Epic Adventures are a step-up program where you receive classroom interruption, wilderness first aid training, and a custom three-day training all leading up to adventure that you'll never forget. This course is also 100% for free for veteran and first responders. Applications are open from May 1st uh, for the Alagazza River Canoe Strip up in Maine and May 15th for the North Pole Plaza Trail. Uh, apply today on another summit.org. You look all spiffy. What, what's uh, 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 I'm trying to stay warm. Really? Uh, like it's I, like... threw a, I, I threw a sweater on. Oh, I, don't, I don't have it's, you know, I don't, I don't have the luxury of burning all that excess fuel that you do. So I'm got a sweater on here. Outrageous. All my fuel is in my car. You know, I'm, I'm, burning up talking about this great borscht belt time so i i'm just excited excited. you know we to be honest i haven't uh i talked about this with steve aaron back in the ellenville area uh when he did the uh uh episode four so jesus that was 113 episodes ago and he was talking about the uh oh uh tag correct me what's the the name of the the place he worked at Neville Falls View, Granite. Neville, the Neville. Uh, Which is it, 11 spelt backwards. Exactly. And I told my wife that, and she was like, wow. So uh, let's get on to finally the guest of the night. Let's go. Boom. Ooh, an hour and eight minutes into this, and we are getting into finally the, the guest of the night. Uh, Dr. Peter Chester. He's a doctor. Uh, I didn't know this beforehand. But uh, I, as, as I said at the beginning, it's it's a PhD, which, uh, according to my father, you know, and, and this was actually I got finally, I was was over dissertation for a long time, and I figured in two thousand nine, and I I had long since retired, and I said, you know, and, and I, I had set up my own consulting business. Uh, I said, yeah, you know what, I may as well do it because I'm paying New York University this maintenance of matriculation and matriculation fee, so. In, in May of 2009, I said to my father, Pop, you know, I got my doctorate and, you know, in his, in his mix of German and Yiddish and English, bust my dust, what does that mean? I said, no, it, see, you know, what is that? Doc's philosophy, so you're a philosopher. I said, no, no, that's just the name of it. And he was pulling my leg a little bit because, uh, you know, the only doctor that he uh, recognized is his medical doctor. Which is interesting because my, my brother-in-law is a, uh, a periodontal surgeon, but it doesn't matter. It's not the right kind of surgeon, you know, because the teeth don't, <laughs> the 
feet don't count. It's uh, and and the, the 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 license plate was the uh, the MD plate was the uh, uh, and and that was in part because my I had two uncles who were doctors. My my mother's brother and my grandmother's brother, and uh, you know they would just park the car wherever they wanted to park the car, while you know the rest of the the rest of the the, the world was looking for parking spaces and saying, oh well, I hope I have those days the meters were nickel and dime now significantly more. So uh, so so that that was the that that's the, the story of, of of that. So I you you I can I can begin I I can begin in. Uh, I was born in 1953 in 1950 summer of 1956 we found ourselves in this place in uh on route 42 not too far from shandaken 42 goes 42 is an interesting route yeah. because two starts at the delaware down by port jervis and it winds its way all the way up past route 28 and and, and up from the the sullivan county borscht catskills it, it touches the it, well it, the geographic Catskills because uh, we're we're just on the southern edge of it, uh, the Ellenville part of it, you know, Schwan Gunks I think that for the Gunks. Uh, so so this this little place, Big Indian, was uh, this little hotel called the Elizabeth House, and it still stands by the way. Uh, only now wow. it's been it's been updated to be you know to an Airbnb, uh, and it's interesting because uh, sidebar is that we went from the Jewish farmers to the farmhouse that took guests, to the bungalows, to the inns, to the hotels, to the resorts, to the country clubs, and then and then that, that was the end of it. So we, we stayed at, at this hotel, uh, the Elizabeth House in Big Indian, uh, owned by uh, by German Christians. Uh, and it was kind of antithetical that, uh, and they had been here for a while. They, they, they you know, if you know, in that area of the Hudson Valley, there was a, uh, you had a lot of uh, a lot of Dutch, a lot of uh, uh, German influence. Uh, Irish as you went farther up to the Irish to the Irish Catskills. Uh, so we were there from from 1955 until 1959. And uh, what I do remember, I remember a hurricane. Uh, I remember staying up until October because uh, the polio shots were were just being offered uh, uh, to to the population. I remember a, a big hurricane lamp, this enormous flashlight that uh, had the battery, you know, the batteries in those days were like this. Uh, and I remember a natural stone swimming pool that my mother, speaking of traumatizing, uh, she had me on a harness and a leash. And uh, I just remember being dipped. I mean, my, 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 my father was a little bit more descriptive as, oh, your mother was dipping in the pool like this. Uh, so the story goes, he, he, he ventured down. Uh, with a friend of his, went down Route 42, back into Sullivan County, past Clarryville, past Frost Valley. Uh, he kept going and going until he got to the intersection of Route 42 and Route 52 in Woodburn. And if you if you look at the the, the Catskills on a map, the Forest Belt Catskills, the, the, most of the hotels and the agreed upon number, almost agreed upon, uh, and, and that's a number that was researched by. A uh, friend of mine who's a Sullivan County historian, John Conway, uh, it's 538. It's probably off, but uh, because there were hotels and bungalow colonies stuffed every which way, it depended how you define them. So if you made the right, you would go towards, and there was a sign, you know, Monticello 13, Ellenville 13. And uh, for some reason, he made a left. He went down Route 52 uh, past Tamarack Lodge, which is a beautiful hotel. That had a golf course that you first saw and my father tells the story i'm not interested because i don't play golf so he got down to downtown greenfield park which consisted of cast corner which is an I interesting place i'll talk about that in a minute and uh saw a lot of signs grand mountain skyway uh pioneer he made a right turn went up mountaindale road and there was grand mountain on the right side that looked pretty good there was no golf course so right away he said oh it's no golf course uh, and, and the sidebar is, uh, you know, my, my father, my father's an American success story. He came here as, uh, uh, as a, as a camp survivor he's in Auschwitz from age 15 until age uh, 19. Uh, and, and he became successful here, but, you know, knowing the value of the buck, he also held on to it pretty tightly. So I, I, I used to say, oh, go on, pop, you took a look at this place called Tamarack that had the golf course and you right away figured 
that they're going to rake you over the coals here. So you wanted to look for a little schlock house. So he turned into Grand Mount and he went to Grand Mount. And, and, and it was very, very typical of the, the hotels at that time. Uh, you had the stucco buildings that, that had the, uh, uh, looked like, like, uh, like, uh, like an English Tudor kind of style. Uh, they would call it part of it. They call Catskill mission style architecture. Uh, and, and the design was pretty prevalent throughout all of the hotels. He goes in, goes into the lobby. He meets uh, the owner. The father was there with a friend of his, uh, who, who was also at the Elizabeth House for a short period of time. And the owner says, you know what? And this is my father telling me the story. Uh, because we were we were actually still at Begindia. He had taken this trip without us. Uh, and uh, my father says, well, he said, look, it's lunchtime. Why don't you come in and have lunch with my guests? And then we can talk about, you know, staying here. And that sold him on the place because, uh, yes, he, he did drink borscht. My father could, could consume gallons of it. He, he loved it. It's very refreshing. And uh, so we found ourselves at Grand Mountain Hotel and day camp. And the day camps were a very, very big attraction because you, uh, there's seven day a week day camps. You get rid of your kid at eight o'clock in the morning. You <laughs> come home at 1130 and wash his face. Kids would have their own dining room. And you wouldn't see him again until four o'clock in the afternoon, and then at six o'clock they'd go and eat, and you wouldn't see them again until so. So this was a this was a, a great deal. Uh, so so the smaller hotels that that we would call two fifty houses, and that was roughly how many people they held. Although most of them held a little bit more, uh, we found ourselves at Grand Mountain from nineteen. My sister was from nineteen fifty nine until uh, it was sold in 1973. Uh, and, and although my, my parents didn't continue their Borscht Belt saga, I was still working up here. And in fact, I, I, was, I was one of the last of my generation to, to work up here in various capacities. Oh, wow. uh, kind of, at that time, I, I was pretty much in my not chosen career of education. I just found myself in it. And it kind of, some of the, the higher ups kind of indicated that it was time for me to hang up, uh, to hang up the, the that, that day I was a major B, to hang up the tray. Uh, and I said, gee, you know, it's interesting. You're not talking to, to some of my colleagues who are principal by day and by summer. Oh, it's Uncle Milky. It's Uncle, Uncle Lenny. That's okay. But for me to, you know, for me to make, make a good buck, it's not. So anyhow, so we found ourselves at Grand Mountain. Uh, I, 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 I was pretty, pretty, uh, uh, mature for my age. So I, I had to case this joint before I, you know, before I settled in, you know, and I, I, uh, I, I wrote a little narrative for a book that's coming out with a friend of mine, uh, that talks about the memories. And then I said, you know, I looked at the place and I went into the main house and I saw the office and I said, you know, I didn't know the word at the time. I said, this is the, this is the control center. This is the nexus of the place. Uh, so I, I, I settled into into that that eight week summer that actually became a little bit longer in the smaller hotels. It was not unusual for the guests to come up uh, a little earlier. Uh, so I settled into it. My father settled into it. My mother settled into it. Uh, he was one of the, he he was for the longest time the only Holocaust survivor who was there. Most of the young Jewish families were there. The, the fathers were were uh, some of them were World War II veterans. Uh, Many of them were Korean War veterans. So this was the late 50s, late fifties, early sixties. So the sidebar to this is that that was the time post World War II, where the hotels up here started a uh, mammoth uh, recasting of their entire image to make it more appealing to younger people. So you know these were resort hotels, and country clubs. Uh, Tamarack Lodge, the smart one from Tamarack Lodge, just as the name, the lodge being, well, you know, it's this, this like Adirondack style lodge. Tamarack Lodge to Tamarack Lodge, the smart country club. Hmm. So, you know, you, you went from Grossinger's Hotel to Grossinger's Hotel and Country Club, and then just Grossinger's with, with, with on the bottom of the billboard, Grossinger's as every. Hmm. So you went from Neville Hotel to the Neville Country Club, uh, and and in making that transformation, what they did was they, they the, the original architecture. And if you look at some of the vintage pictures, 
they all basically looked the same. You had the main house that had this long, expansive porch uh, that, that was covered, but had these arch openings. Uh, and, and you'd sit there because that's where you would get the air 24-7, if you like. If, if, if it was raining outside, you'd sit there, you'd get the air. So post-World War II, they, they decided to close in these porches and build new air-conditioned lobbies. So they built lobbies, they put carpeting in, they they paneled the lobbies, they they took the, the, the one incandescent light out and they put in fluorescent lights or high hats. They started dropping the ceilings with the tiles that which in those days were were were, were tile on the outside with, 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 with asbestos on the inside. Uh, and, and it took an altogether different look. It was a more modern and appealing look. They started to build new deluxe rooms that had private tiled baths. The, the hotels, again, and this was true for all of them until in the early 60s where they, they most of them got rid of the, the convenient bath and shower. So the convenient bath and shower meant you had a room. You had a sink in the room, you had a medicine cabinet in the room, and if you had to go to the bathroom, you could walk down the hall. If you took a shower, you'd walk down the hall. If you went to the bath. Uh, then the second room arrangement was the semi-private bath. And then when you were really up there, you had the private bath. And then when you were really at the top, you had the private bath in the newer building with the tiled bathroom. Uh, air conditioning came later. Yeah, Air conditioning for smaller places, uh, for the smaller places came, came later. So, so, Peter, how would you uh, characterize the, the vibe of the time when you were there at the Borschfeld? It was it was paradise. I mean, it was nice. it was Disneyland for the kids. It was Disneyland for the adults. Wow. Uh, for the most part, you know, these were and, and I was I was the brat because I lived in Manhattan, which you know, I lived on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, a, a big tall building that overlooked Riverside Drive, and a lot of my the overwhelming majority of the guests in the, the Grand Mountain, it held true for the bungalow colonies. You know, they catered to the apartment dwellers. You know, a lot of these people had, you know, the apartments in Flatbush, Brooklyn, which now are, you know, ooh, you got, you, you have the, the original sink. That's great. You know, when my parents sold their co-op on the Upper West Side, they had the original bathtub. Oh, wow. What are you talking about? Look at this old piece of junk over here. It's cracked. Uh, so, so these were people who were living in apartments and, and they didn't have any air conditioning either. So, so this was, this was their, 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 their opportunity to get out of the city for eight weeks. Uh, the parents also, uh, it was Disneyland for the adults. And, and it, it was an overarching philosophy that, that carried, carried the owners throughout the, the two big ages. And again, and this is a description of historian John Conway, the Silver Age, which, which ended around 1925 or so, and, and the Golden Age that went from that time all the way to the end. Uh, Every man was a king, every woman was a queen, and all the kids were princes and princesses. Uh, you know, you, 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 you know. I, I remember, I remember very, very clearly. You know, all the all the, the the men would come up with their bar mitzvah watches and their suits, and the women would borrow the jewelry from mommy, and they wore mink stoles. And, and the, you know, when the temperature dropped below seventy, they'd put on a mink stole, and even if it didn't, if, if you know, they would put on the mink stoles. And uh, even in the smaller places, Saturday nights we dress up, and you, you go into the dining room, you could eat everything and anything and any quantity that, that that you wanted, nonstop. And and then you would go out and you 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 you, you could play cards, play mahjong, sit by the pool, play tennis, play uh, paddle ball, volleyball, go into the coffee shop and and stuff yourself full of chocolate malteds and and, and egg creams and ice creams. And then at night, you, you would have entertainment of a sort every single night. Uh, Saturday nights at 2.45 in the morning, some poor misbegotten woman who was rather well endowed, top and bottom, would get up on the stage and do a 15-minute show culminating in her taking everything off. She what? What would you say, Peter? Hey, what? what was what? that? Whoa, 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 whoa. What, what am I hearing here? Yeah, that, that, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that. So we, uh, Lean in, Peter. Uh, yeah, tell us about... What's going on in the after hours here? Yeah, the after hours were interesting. Uh, Grand Mountain <laughs> was notorious for, uh, for having for having a, a stripper at 
quarter to three in the morning. A water? A water? A stripper. Oh. As in take over everything. So your, your in- father didn't play golf, but... No, he didn't play golf, <laughs> but he had a front row seat. <laughs> Bird's eye view of, of the, <laughs> these poor misbegotten souls. And, uh, you know, and I, yeah. I must tell you that at the tender age of 11-ish or so, when the hormones started to percolate... <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. We found out that... If we were to scratch some of the paint off the dressing room window, we could uh, we could sneak a peek and see what all the hoopla. So what I'm what I'm hearing, Peter, is that left turn was the right turn. It was abs- there was no question about okay. that. The- so so and maybe this is a poor segue um, into this topic, which I think is somewhat of a sensitive topic, and I don't want to be indelicate about it. But you describe the the atmosphere, the vibe at these Borscht Belt resorts, which later portrayed themselves or named themselves as country clubs. But in, in that hedonistic, uh, fun environment, can you compare that to the, the Holocaust? Your father was a Holocaust survivor. Many of the people, maybe not at the place where your family was staying but at others were holocaust survivors and what if any role did the holocaust have and uh people immigrating to this country that were survivors of the holocaust have in terms of just propelling the res- the borscht belt resorts from the silver age into the golden age if you will yeah, the, the original the original farmers were were the Jewish farmers uh, who came here from Eastern Europe, and and surprisingly they were not all farmers. Uh, they came here looking for the proverbial better life. Uh, they went to the Lower East Side, and I tell you the story of Malka and Sally Grossinger. Uh, he was an ill man. Uh, came up, found their way up to Ferndale, which was later named Grossinger in New York, uh, and and the, the rest is history. Uh, the, the Borscht Belt area that, that at one point was very, very anti-Semitic, and, and uh, uh, my friend Alan Frischman, who, who lived in Mountaindale, a prolific collector, uh, had some of the signs that said, no Hebrews, no consumptives. Uh, if you Google it, you can see some of the advertisements uh, catering to a Gentile clientele. So that that started to change uh, in, in 1899 when the flag river came the first uh, hotel of its time to to accept Jews, and then by the time you got to 1910-ish or so, the, the Silver Age had, had, was well underway, and, and and we started to have these Jewish farms that had now become Jewish Jewish hotels, and the advertisements that you would see in some of the Jewish newspapers were, were in Yiddish, and you know, you have dietary laws observed and everything, so uh, by that time, the, the, the overwhelming majority uh, not all of them, but the overwhelming majority were filled by Jews who, who were the original Jewish farmers. And, and around the 19 teens or so, the second generation of those farmers were the first generation American born. And again, in those days, you did what your father did, with some exception. In, in the case of Grand Mountain, uh, which was a Steinhorn family, uh, one of the brothers, Paul, he, was, uh, he left the farm, he went to medical school, pretty much never to return. But that was the exception rather than the rule. So it was a safe place for Jews at a time when parts of America, and it was not just it was not just small towns, even even the large cities, you still had some restrictions. You had the story of 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 uh, uh, and, and there was a fact check on it. Uh, Arthur Godfrey and some other people in Florida who who, who had hotels that 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 were notoriously restricted. Uh, but but overall, that aside, the Borscht Belt Catskills w- was a it, it was a haven for Jews where Jews could be Jews. Uh, you, you could wear the Star of David. You could you could display your Jewishness, e- even though there were no Holocaust survivors at Grand Mountain until later. Uh, there were uh, you know there were there were they they knew about it. They were proud to be Jews, and they could freely uh, freely be Jews and, and mingle and mingle with 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 other Jews up here. Again, for my father, my, my, my father spoke very readily about about his experiences. He he went back to Europe. My grandparents uh, remained in Brussels. They, they actually came here, and then they went back to Brussels uh, 
after after the war. Uh, and uh, you know, the last car my father bought was a big Mercedes that I still have. And uh, somebody said to him, uh, "Why'd you do that?" I said, "Well, let me tell you why. When when I was arrested and uh, I was being led to the camp, I fell." And and when I fell, one of the guards hit me on the head with a bottle. And I just remember looking at the hubcap on the staff car and seeing the star. Mm-hmm. I said, here I am. Many years later, I walked into the dealership and I said, give me that car. And before the guy said, well, how are you going to finance it? He said, just give me the wire transfer information. I'm going to buy it. He said, so I won. <laughs> so, so and, and it's interesting because that, that was, uh, you know, he didn't have this philosophy of hatred. I can't stand him. He had this philosophy that he won, that, you know, he, he was one of the lucky ones. He also said that, you know, on Passover, when he opened the door for the Shia, he said, I, I don't have to do that because he came for me already. I can be here. So it, it was a very safe place. It, it was a very, very safe place. And, and, and the underlying force was that he and, and, and American Jews also who had been subject to to anti-semitism many times in the workplace uh many times in housing uh, and even in the big cities they came up here and they were safe they didn't have to hide their jewishness they didn't have to hide their they didn't they didn't have to 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 hide their love for jewish ethnic cuisine and and along with all of that it got them out of the city and it made them feel important And, and i i wrote part of my master's dissertation Unfortunately, uh, it's no longer around because the, the only remaining copies were destroyed in a fire. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I thought they were, I thought that it would be archived, but of course, you know, I talked about microfilm and they looked at me like I was off my wheel. Hmm. Uh, so so it, it was the Jewish boys married the Brooklyn boys married their best girls, and then what? And it, it talked about this whole these whole dynamics of 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 coming up here and. And regardless of what you did, and I said, well, whether you were Max the porter at Coney Island Hospital or Jack the taxi cab driver, it didn't matter. You came up and you were a king. You would go into the dining room, and, and that was a popularity in small places. And you would say to the waiter, Abe, who was a boss, Abe promised me an end cut of roast beef. So all of a sudden, you know, this average Joe was a king. He, you, you would go in and Lox was a very big delicacy. It was a very expensive delicacy. If you wanted to have one portion of ten portions, you could have whatever you wanted. Wow. You know, you would and you would be you would sit down at a at a table that had a tablecloth, that had table linens, that had had two forks, uh, a knife, a soup spoon, two teaspoons, and you would be served your dinner, your breakfast, your lunch, your dinner, you would be served by a waiter. Of course, we were all nice Jewish boys going to going to college to be doctors, but you were being served, and 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 you know, you could play cards, you could do whatever turned you on, you could you could see shows that you know back in the day, I mean, even at, at the smaller houses, you know, Rodney Dangerfield was 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 at Grand Mountain, Alan Paul from Manhattan Transfer was the uh, master of ceremonies, uh, and and the list goes on and on and on, yeah, and. If you had the opportunity, and also if your climbing skills and the second story skills were good, you could climb the fence and get in to see, you know, big acts at the big hotels. So, so it was it was a fantasy land that a lot of the people worked double and double and triple overtime and put their monies away all year long, so that they could they could afford this. So you understand that in. In, in, in 1973, which was the last year of Grand Mountain's operation uh, under, under that family, Steinlin family's ownership, if you stayed in the best room in the place, it cost you $1,650 for the summer. Oh, that, wow. was, that was the wife, two children, Oof. husband up on weekends and a two-week vacation for eight weeks that actually translated into closer to nine weeks. And the only thing you have to pay were the tips. You know, you pay the tips in the dining room. If you were a little adept at the card table, you know you you could recoup some of that. And 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 the the, the Brooklyn boys, and I, I I don't mean that in any disrespectful manner. It was just to highlight what 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 the these newly married couples and even the older married couples what they had to do 
to make that $1,650 to have that summer when they were making, you know, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Wow. Whatever they had to do mm-hmm. to make that so that they could come up and 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 the kids were in day camp. I mean, we did things in day camp. We went on we went on trips, we went on hikes, we were swimming, we played ball, we went to the movies, we 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 made those campy lanyard things. So so Peter, how would this uh I mean I don't I don't know if you've ever gone to any other destinations besides the Catskills, how would this compare to the, the other like vacation destinations? Uh, I, I've been to, 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 uh, you, you name it. And I've been there. My wife and I are very avid, uh, uh cruisers. We, we, we enjoy cruising to me. And, and here it is way after the heyday there, there are almost zero resorts left. Although Grand Mountain is still running under Russian, Russian Christian ownership. Uh, the buildings, most of the buildings are still there. Uh, I, I do go back there. I take my ceremonial swim in the same swimming pool that I took the deep water test swimming, of course. Nice. I actually cheated on, I cheated on that because I wore a t-shirt <laughs> and I had a little flotation device, uh, you know, on, on, on my belly. So I, I, I mean, I could, I could have swum it, but I, 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 I figured this was very creative. So I was a little bit of a, a little bit of an upstart when I was a kid. Uh, for me, it, it it was, is, and forever will be uh, paradise. I, 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 I you know, I, you see updated versions. You go on a cruise ship; it's all you can eat. Gee, I've been there, done that. You go, you go, you go to a, a, a fancy resort. You go to you go to a ski resort, or you go here. We have we have a, a billion dollar casino and a half a billion dollar water park. And I go into the half a billion dollar water park, and I said, well, it's basically an indoor pool, and. Uh, you know, I, 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 Grand Mountain didn't have one, but you know, I would make my way to the other resorts. And, and just a sidebar is that uh, my friend Marissa Scheinfeld, who, who was uh, involved with a uh, project called Historical Market Project, wrote a wonderful book filled with photographs of, of the hotels. Uh, uh, you know, and it was sad in a sense, but there's one picture that's very popular of the swimming pool at Gross Singers, the indoor pool, that in 1963 or so when it was built, the gross senior family said it cost us a million dollars and we paid cash for it. Uh, you know, yeah, you look at it. I mean, now it's all demolished. You look at it, it was overthrown and destroyed. And I close my eyes and I say to myself, holy cow, I'm an eight-year-old kid, a 10-year-old kid. And I went into this thing and I thought I was swimming across the Atlantic Ocean. and I was going to wind up on, on you know, the shores of England. Mm. Uh, so so the, 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 it, it, anything that I've experienced today, I look back and I said, well, you know, Perhaps it wasn't as big and grand. Uh, you know, you didn't have rooms with steam showers. You didn't have different kinds of amenities. But but the, the concept was was the same. Uh, you 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 let loose when you go on vacations, and that's what people did. And you know, to go back to the Jewish thing, uh, particularly important for, for, for Jews, and particularly important for. For, for not not only for the Holocaust survivors, but for those people who who didn't have the riches that that were promised to them if you if you come to America for whatever the reason may be personally or politically mm-hmm. or whatever is material. So Peter, just going back to some of the economic components while you were talking, I looked up in 1972 the basic trim model of the VW Beetle also known as the bug sold for stosh you want to take a stab at it how much did a 1972 volkswagen bug sticker for oh god probably around the, uh six thousand oh you're so off you're so oh. off uh it's uh it was two thousand four hundred and twenty dollars and peter tells us that the summer for a typical family at the grand hill was one thousand six hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> so so you were about 800 bucks away from buying a brand new volkswagen bug which you couldn't park anywhere in new york city at the time probably because of parking constraints where the whole family could go up and spend <laughs> eight weeks more or less um and which which brings me to my next question peter would your father stay the whole eight weeks at the uh grand hill 
Grand Mountain. Uh, no, I'll tell you what my father did. It was interesting. I mean, my father was a uh, was a, a, a diamond cutter by trade. He, he had his own business. He got into it after after he was uh, after he was freed from from Auschwitz. He came back to Brussels. His brother, his older brother, who survived, was was eight years older, seven years older, and he had already graduated from, from college in, in Cologne. Uh, so my father was was all of what nineteen or twenty years old. He didn't have any skills. So we had an aunt who lived in in, in New York, lived in the Bronx, and said, uh, you know, in German, schick der Kleine nach Antwerpen, lern ihm uh, Diamanten Polisseur kann 400 Dollar die Woche machen. Mm. Send the little one to Antwerp to learn diamond polishing, which is diamond cutting. And he'll come to America and make $400 a week, which was in 1947. Wow, bad. So he, he found himself a diamond as a diamond cutter. He became very, very good at it. Uh, and he came to America, and he didn't make the four hundred the first week. He made it the second week. So, you know, off. so, so, so he, he he made that money. I mean, the sidebar is, yeah, he made it, except the fact that it wasn't a forty-hour work week. So, what my father did, we would go up at the end of June, and uh, this was before I worked there. And that's a, a, an interesting interesting marketing concept with, that some of the smaller hotels did with regard to who got the jobs in the dining room and the counters. Uh, so we'd come up around the end of June. Uh, my father would stay up for a couple of days, and he'd, he'd, he'd then go back. We'd go back Sunday night, as most of the as most of the, the, the fathers did. They go back Sunday night, and depending upon what they would do with their vacations, a lot of them, instead of taking a week or two, would come up Thursday night and have three day weekends throughout the summer. Yeah. So my father would come up Thursday nights and have three day weekends, uh, and go back and go back Sunday. And then come back the, the following Thursday. What happened in the interim uh, is, is is another, you know, adult only story, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. And I promise I'll keep it like a family show, <laughs> but also spell, <laughs> spell some of the myths about it. Uh, so that was, and, and they would come up, and and, and again, I, I I go back to my my dissertation where I said, and Jack would take the taxi, and he park it in the corner, and he put on his quote unquote Sunday best, and he was a king. So the, the fathers would do that. Most of the mothers were stay-at-home moms. Uh, you know, they, they had the, again, it was very stereotypical. Yep. Uh, have, you'd have, if, if, you, if you, you had two kids and one was a boy and one was a girl, you were done. If you didn't, maybe you'd have a third or maybe you'd just end it because it was expensive. Uh, and, and it was not only expense, it was the, the apartment back in, in Brooklyn was not large enough to have those large families. So this was just before uh, you, you had uh, uh, the Podolskys, who were the family uh, who developed Canarsie and, and would sell, you know, you two can afford a house, the nondescript two-family brick houses, where the tenant in the walk-in would pay basically for your mortgage, so you live tax, you live mortgage-free. But that was before. This was in the earlier parts of the 1960s. Uh, so uh, that, that's typically what happened. And and they, these were one car families, so uh, and and there was no real reason for you to leave the hotel. We could walk down to Cass Corner, which which had the, you know, which had the sundry store. If you were in Fallsburg or Liberty and in, in, in Monticello, you could get to these villages. So it's not like you were trapped on the premises. But most of the most of the the, the kids were in camp all day, except me because I was a camp runaway. Uh, part of it had to do with the fact that I really sucked at baseball, and I had no, uh, I, I didn't become good at it until it was too old to make a difference. Uh, so, you know, when they played baseball, I was, you know, someplace else, uh, dancing to my own tune. So I was kind of an early juvenile delinquent. Uh, but there was no reason for them to leave the premises as such. And the hotel owners really didn't want you to leave the premises because, you know, while there were a lot of guests, there was also a lot of competition. So you didn't want, you didn't want them to wander too far or talk to to too many people who would say, well, gee, you know, I see what you're getting here. Why don't you come see me at the, why don't you come see me at Tamarack or why don't you come see me at Beer Kill or some of the other hotels and you go say, oh, wow, they, they've got nicer rooms. That, that Jewish competition. Yeah, it's exactly what it was. Uh, and and the probably the, the focal point of the, the competition was what was on the menu. Uh, you know, gee, look at this place. For what I'm paying here, I could pay there and instead of having, you know, 20 choices for lunch i could have 26 choices for lunch uh, wow you know so, so 
you know, you had that kind of competition. So that's basically, that's basically what happened. So, you know, the mommies were women of leisure. They would sleep late. You, you didn't have to do anything other than, you know, 7.30 say, you know, okay, uh, kids get up, time to go to camp and go back to sleep. Or, or you could, you could, uh, run in, have breakfast, go out, uh, and, 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 and as my mother used to say, I'm going to work on my tan. Little did they, <laughs> they know that I was working the way into having a complexion like, like, like a leather glove. Uh, although they, they offset it by, by smearing this, this orange stuff called Ban de Soleil that, that was like, you know, like axle grease that they would put on. <laughs> would give you this golden bronze look because the, the, this, one of the signs of success was you would have this, you would have perfectly coiffed hair, something that I no longer have. Uh, my father had it, but he, it took, he took it off at night and, and put it on the styrofoam thing. Uh, so, so you would have this healthy looking head. It didn't matter whether you know you had a little crunchy or stuff. So, I, I take it this is before the popularity of a baseball cap as a casual, oh, that, you know, ex- accessory. Ah, uh, you didn't have that. You would have the men would be broiling in the sun playing cards. Mm-hmm. If you killed two birds with one stone, you could, you could, or actually three, if you count the winnings in, mm-hmm. you cards hopefully win and you get a suntan at at the, at the same time. So 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 you know they would do that. That was way before anybody knew about sun protection factors. Mm-hmm. And that. Peter, I'm, I'm going to ask you this because I know Stosh is really chomping at the bit to get to Dirty Dancing. So I'm I'm going to segue us there to asking you, did you ever work? I mean, you told us before that you had some jobs um, at the the hotel and at another resort, but why don't you tell us about that? What what it was like working at one of these hotels or resorts in the 60s and early 70s? It, it was interesting because a, a clever marketing concept, and I alluded to that before, the smaller hotels was when the kids became old enough in order to keep the parents there, you'd hire the kid. <laughs> so, but if you if you wanted to still have fun and not make too much money, you would be a counselor. Uh, if you wanted to have a little less fun and make a whole lot more money, you go into the dining room. So, I of course wanted to be a counselor, and my father of course had other ideas. So, I found myself in the dining room. I was a uh, and, and Grand Mountain. You would graduate. Uh, you would you would start off as a newspaper soda boy. And then you would graduate to being a busboy in the children's dining room, a waiter in the children's dining room, a busboy in the main dining room, and a waiter in, uh, and a waiter in the main dining room. So I, I actually, I, I actually, I was not not that I was big for my age, but I was mature for my age. So uh, by the time I was eleven years old, I, I was in my blacks and whites, which was the standard uniform and the uh, and the clip-on bow tie, and. Uh, and, and the uncomfortable waiter shoes. And I found myself as a busboy in the children's dining room. So now I went from sleeping in my parents' best room in a joint to sleeping in the chicken coops. So the, the staff houses were interesting. Yeah, they were actual chicken coops. And uh, <laughs> wow. You could the chicken the, the smell from the chickens was always there. And if you if you looked hard enough and in the right place, you would actually see the feathers of the, the chickens in these chicken coops. So we were we slept in the chicken coops. We slept with uh, and and uh, when my father was not there, my mother had had some pity for her little prince, and she would let me you know, stay in stay in. So the, so Peter, I, I I think you're skirting around where we want to go with this. So I'm I'm gonna draw I'm gonna draw you into the fire here. Um, you you worked in the kids' dining room, Mazel Tov. You you get your black and whites. You're in your preteen years. You're advancing up the ranks, and then you you're in your now your teen years, and I think you said earlier in the show something about hormones, if I remember correctly. <laughs> so let's were- let's let's talk about those years, if you will, Peter, and if you can relate to us, just the, how up. how much of a paradise was the it was, the it grand was a- the Grand Mountain Grand Mountain Hotel and similar hotels. Let me talk about Grand Mountain. Uh, at, at or around the tender age of, I was born in January, so 12 and a half or so. It was prior to my bar mitzvah. Some of the older boys decided that uh, I, they should open me up to some interesting 
uh, experiences. So I made the acquaintance now, of Peter. Before you go into this, do you need to close the door? Is your wife in the background? <laughs> oh, as a matter of fact, it's the only one who's here is my cat. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> okay, so, okay. so let's roll. Let's roll the film, Peter. Yeah. My, she, she actually, she actually knows. She actually knows the story, as does <laughs> my daughter and uh, my 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 grandson knows knows it because we, we had that. You know, my my daughter's a single parent, so my grandson and I had this conversation at that. The talk. Point. Yeah, we had the talk. So uh, at or around that that time, uh, I made the acquaintance of uh, two of the uh, of the uh, friendlier members of the day camp staff. Uh, and from, from that, from that point onward, I, I would probably, well, I'll, I'll, I won't, I'll be as delicate as I can. Well, this, this show's rated explicit. You can just dive right into this, Peter. We're okay, all, we're I mean, all I, adults I, here. <laughs> yeah. I, I had initially, I, until I perfected the technique with the, the, uh, counsel of some of the older, older guys, I had difficulty making it past second base. So by the time I was, uh, by the time August rolled around, uh, you know, I, I was I was smacking out home runs. So, so that that added another dimension. But the downside of it was, you know, all of the carnal adventures ended ended with Rosh Hashanah because you abruptly it ended abruptly. And you know, I would go on winter hiatus. Uh, part of it was I, I went to an old boys high school, which uh, you know, which was difficult, and the, the social interactions. We had, and, and, and I'm going to get really smacked because I'm very politically incorrect. Uh, I, I wasn't sure whether it was with an all girls high school or whether, you know, we, we went into the ASPCA, the one of the kennels by mistake because hmm. the girls were ugly. There was nothing appealing about them. And, and of course, I, I you know, was not, not about to, to, to do that. Uh, we just so lost all of our on. female listeners, I think. So we, we went on, we went on hiatus. Uh, we went on hiatus and, uh, it was interesting because there were a lot of summer romances that, uh, and, and I tell you that Grand Mountain, there were half a dozen of them that, uh, and, and out of the half a dozen, five of them were still married. Oh, uh, so you had some of that. So, uh, so is it true as portrayed in Dirty Dancing that? Yeah, to a, to a degree it was, but that that's on, that's on a different level. So, so what I'm talking about, and, and it was in my age group. Uh, was was with, with the interactions between between age groups that were the same. So mm -hmm. you know the idea was to, to get yourself set up with uh, you know with, with with one of the girls early in the summer. So this would last the entire summer. And and I, I will tell you very honestly, you know, people are going to say, oh well, you know, it was round, it was an orgy every night. No, it really wasn't. <laughs> but one, we, we, we were tired. We, we were tired. So <laughs> <laughs> it was, and 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 this. <laughs> It was not just it was not just us macho guys doing it. The girls wanted to, you know, the girls wanted to have 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 they, the girl the female hormones were, were every bit as active. Yeah, but you guys but, worked all day. Like that's the thing. Yeah, we we were tired. I mean, I would tell you that most of the there, there were times when I said, you know, screw this, I'm going to go back to my parents' room. I'm going to get a good night's sleep because I'm tired. Uh, sure, sure, you did, you know, Peter. A lot of it was a lot of it was you just you know you wanted a, a warm body next to you. You know, uh, and, and some of it was some of it was ego. I'm not going to say it's not. Uh, so, so Peter, the, is this all in the forthcoming book? Is this what the the forthcoming uh, book is about? That you well, if it gets if it gets past the censors, you know, it, it, it will be. Uh, but the dirty dancing part is something different. And, mm -hmm. and, and How so? Why don't you Why don't you get the record straight on that? Okay, so here's the record that's straight. Uh, initially, the the hotels hired hunky looking college boys who were like 20 ish or so and part of it was to keep the young mommies occupied all right we've heard enough now okay this is this is going beyond explicit. Oh, no, no. no i gotta hear this i gotta hear this <laughs> the young mommies and 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 to to, to degree dirty dancing i it was the, the truth of it was that that yeah you had you had a hunky looking staff to keep the female guests occupied, and 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 you can you can take that word occupied and present it any number of ways. And you're, uh, and you're not ruling out any particular way that anyone's mind wanders when presenting this no, no, in not at said all. And ways. I, I can again, and I, I go back to to to, to the uh, to the, the paper that I wrote. Uh, 
and I'll give you I'll give you for example the, the one that was conveniently destroyed or yeah, lost. Was, but I remember it pretty vaguely, pretty clearly. <laughs> uh, basically, you know what would happen was when when I, I titled it, "The Brooklyn Boys Marry the Best Girls." The rest of it was, and they got married, and 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 instead of making out in the in, in the back seat or the front seat of the cars, it was my father said, "You see now why single men should never buy cars with bucket seats." You know, which was my 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 <laughs> macho misogynistic father, and I to which I said to him, I said, "So let me get this straight: you and my mother in the back seat of your Buick." And oh, that's huge, though. It was the only time I I saw fire in his eyes, and I said, "I should going to kill me." And even though I'm the only son, I'm not willing to the world. So, you know, other than that, uh, and, and there were a couple of ma- couple of wedding night pregnancies because you knew this was a guy you're going to be with. So the mommies came up. The mommies, they, they had their kids. They had them by C-section. And C-sections in those days were butcher jobs. Well, it doesn't matter because the only person going to look at you nude now is your husband. And once you settle into, into the married life, you know, you, you're going to be tired from those responsibilities. So the, the the concept of all of this is that you know the the husbands the husbands got a little paunchy. They weren't these these hunky hunky guys that they once were. The women got a little paunchy because the the female health care only said, "Listen, what we got to do is get the baby out. Forget about what happened. So you can't wear a bikini anymore. You'll wear a two piece bathing suit, and you know you'll wear a bra and the basic bathing suit that will support you." So it was very misogynistic, but it it it, it was true. So now here are the mommies who are alone, daddies are in the city, and uh, you got these hunky guys, and there's a little flirting going on back and forth. So the psychology of it was, in one sense, the women wanted to, they, they needed a re, it's not that they were, they, were, they were horny and they wanted to bang these guys and have other experiences, they really didn't. Some did, and, and sometimes it culminated into that, but in a, in a more saner sense, you know, they, they needed somebody, somebody to find them attractive still attractive two pregnancies later and you know and a little tinge of gray and a couple of as i understand it peter i'm I'm st- the pieces are starting to come together for me you're talking about um young mommies hunky staff is this mm-hmm. what is this what they meant by the saying grossingers has everything yeah to a degree that's what that's what they that's what they meant that was the everything um, they're talking about yeah, that was the area that it was again, it was more prevalent at the smaller hotels where you had the seasonal guests because at the larger hotels, you didn't have the seasonal guests because a that was not what they that that was not what they were designed to be. They were not designed to be family hotels. Uh, they, they were designed to, to you, you'd go there. Well, we know they're not designed to be family hotels from what you just told us. Uh, you know, <laughs> it depends how you define the family. So, so you know, the, the the reality is, yes, it did exist. Did it exist to the point where it was this this unbridled Roman orgy? No, of course not. No. Uh, if you if you ask me personally, did I participate in it? Uh, yes, on two occasions. You had fun. You uh, had fun, though. That's that's the whole point of being a teen. No. You know, so, yeah, but but this was this was this was with two mommies. So, Peter, you're telling us you were one of the hunky staff members. Is that? Is that what I'm uh, hearing now? I, I, I was, I was, I was a nice looking Jewish boy. Uh, uh, was, hell yeah, it's Peter, one hundred percent. And Peter, you still are, you still are a nice looking Jewish boy. I'm just throwing uh, that out there. Not that I'm hitting on you, but I just want that on the record. I, you know, men with men with full heads of hair and beards like this, hmm. I've always found attractive. You know, oh, ah, this uh, 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 as we yeah. as we say in the trade of lunch money, he's got you know follicularly <laughs> challenged. So, we're, we're, we we won't go into the um that was good activities Peter. the activities of the 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 hunky staff members i know stosh wants to to move it along but i just want to before we move it along i just want to bring up and maybe you can uh let our listening audience know um because there's a lot of talk about this when you talk about the borscht belt comedians entertainment oh, yeah. comes up and I, I know of this, but just for the audience, I mean, could you cement the point that this was really the uh, catalyst yep. of comedy in this country? It, it was it was more than just comedy, but comedy was it was a principal catalyst for comedy. Uh, and here's why. And, and I say this with a good deal of authority and experience. Even to this day, there is no single 
area where where a, a rising star comedian would have multiple opportunities to test his or her, her craft. Yeah, we had everything from 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 the the Imperial Room at the Concord, where you had the big names, to little bungalow colonies, to showcases, where after everybody was done doing their show, they would get together, and and, and it was not just the newbies; it was the experienced people. The newbies would go there to see the experienced people. So you had these the, this proving ground that existed on on multiple levels, and it was not just for comedians; it, it was for, for 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 variety artists of all kinds. Entertainment. Uh, from, oh yeah, from from enter, entertainment of of all of all of all qualities. You know, uh, a very good. There was a comedy team years ago, Alto and Mantia. Buddy Mantia was uh, was a trained lounge singer. He was great. He was the MC at Grand Mountain, and typically what the master of ceremonies would do to further their career, they would do the MCing, introduce the show, and then they would go out and they would do a show at a different hotel, open for a bigger act. Buddy teamed with a, a, a comedian named Bobby Alto, and they were both you know fledglings, and they put this act together. And uh, the only place they could really fine tune their craft were the, were the hotels in the Borschfeld. You started to have the New York comedy club scene, but that was just one venue. Here in the Borschfeld, you know, you had 538 hotels and, wow. and, and a thousand something bungalow colonies. So you'd have to live to be 300 years old to cover all these places. So you had these proving grounds. And if you were smart, you would take advantage of easier access to persons with different levels of experience. Uh, and, and that went for, for a lot of things, uh, sports as well. But, but with regard to the comedy, you could test your acts without restrictions. If you had a, an act that was a little bit off color, you would, you would book yourself or have the, the agent book you in a late show. If you did something that was mainstream, that was more conservative, well, they 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 book you in in, in Leibowitz Pineview or or Zucker's Glen Wild or or the Pioneer, which were glot kosher, real glot kosher. Like you, this is not this is no game. This isn't the dietary laws, but uh, but but you know sometimes we mix the dishes. This was the real deal, and you had a more conservative audience. So if that was your thing, that was your avenue of comedy. Go there. Uh, Yes, it was mostly Jewish comedy. The original comedians did it in a mixture of Yiddish and, and, and English. But later on, if if that was not your thing, you could do it. You 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 know, Alto and Mantia were a couple of Italian guys who did the Wizard of Oz in Italian. Hmm. Which if oh, wow. you go, go to the bathroom first before you see this, because this is really funny. So so you had this incredible proving ground. And and it didn't cost you anything because you were there. Mm -hmm. and, so, and you had opportunities that, that were just exponential in, 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 in number. So, Peter, if you could, just to give some of our listeners who might not be familiar with yeah, right. the big names who, you know, uh, cut their teeth in the Borscht Belt, why don't you just throw down some names of uh, acts that people would be familiar with? I mean, you, know, you could go back to the origins. You had Danny Kay, who was a tumbler at, at the uh, Young's Gap Hotel. Uh, you had Jan Murray, who was at Paul's Hotel. You had Rodney Dangerfield, who came to Grand Mountain, and he bombed. He was terrible. Uh, couldn't get a laugh. <laughs> was your dad yeah. that tough of an audience? I never liked he, Rodney Dangerfield. Well, audience was either, it was either a, a tough audience or the jokes weren't so funny, or that particular entertainer hadn't quite learned how to play the audience. That's another thing mm -hmm. you were able to do. Yep. You learned how to, you learned how to how to play the audience. You learn how to adjust your act to, to play the audience as opposed to, well, this is what I do if they laugh, fine. And if they don't laugh, that's fine. Also, uh, you had Alan King uh, and, and you had Alan King. You had Jerry Seinfeld. You had Jerry Lewis at Browns and other places. Bob Hope came up here. Uh, the Rat Pack, although although they didn't all appear up here. They were all separate. Uh, because this was, a, it, it was, you know, it was a destination. So you would have Lucille Ball, who didn't appear up here, but when she was married to Gary Morton, you know, you would see them on at, every so often coming to the Gold Coast. That was where the big monkey mugs were at the Concord. 
So, so it was a place to be seen, but for the entertainers, it was a place where any type of comedic act could, could fine tune their skills and, and go on to take those skills and, 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 and use them, use them when they hit the big time. So it was a pathway. And similarly for, for, for musicians as well, you had kids who, who took some some piano lessons and drum lessons and sax lessons and trumpet lessons and all of a sudden they were hired by a small hotel and and maybe they did some bar mitzvah and stuff and they would have to cut a show they would have to have some entertainer come in with with musical charts that went from one end of the piano to the other and they, they they'd have you know an hour or two to rehearse for this and 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 all of a sudden they went from these nervous little kids to to seasoned musicians who could who could play dance music, who could who could improvise, who could read a chart, and 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 they would they would rub elbows with people in show bands who were more experienced, and and it was almost like a master class. So yes, was it the birthplace of American comedy? Absolutely, but it was also part of the birthplace of of a generation of musicians. Who would who would try different genres? You had you had lounge bands. It was a big uh, during the, the the early 1950s up until the end. There, there was an infatuation. Other than you know the joke is well, Jews always have an infatuation with Chinese food, but they also had an infatuation with Latin music. Hmm. So you had Latin lounge bands. You had Tito Puente. Tito Puente would come up here with his daughter with Audrey Puente, and they would they would be at, at grocers. You know, so you would have you would have Latin music. There were hotels that had three bands. They would have a dance band, a show band, and a Latin lounge band. Oh, wow. so, so music, comedy, the arts, uh, and, and just to segue back to that, if you go back to the beginning of the Golden Age in the 1920s at the Flagler, you had uh, you had Moss Hart, uh, you had Kitty Carlisle Hart, Vincent Dwight. You had, you had Broadway's producers who were part of the entertainment staff and they would put on fully staged shows wow. in 1962 at, at grand mountain we put on oklahoma a fully hmm. state version of oklahoma so the arts were a very 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 big part of it and, and not just the talent shows although the talent shows uh you you would have you would have entertainers bet midler bet midler was the house singer at the gibber hotel okay which is uh it was it was a, a one of the one of the few really black kosher hotels. She was a house singer. Hmm. She was a house singer. She told jokes. She did this, and all of a sudden, she found her way. She found her niche, and 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 the rest and the rest is history. Yeah. So so what I'm wow. hearing it was it wasn't all about getting to second base, was it? No, it was it was real. It was really not. It was uh, it was an important part, but it but it was really not. You made money in nineteen. 19- in 1969, 1968, 1968, I was, no, 69. <laughs> I was 16 and a half years old. I made $3,800 in a summer wow. in cash. Wow. That's what wow. Said to me. You understand, so, you're, making, you're making more money than the people you're serving. So did you buy a Volkswagen? Did you go out and buy that $2,400 no, VW? No, what, happened was, what happened was stupid Peter went to New York University at $121 a credit when his friends went to city college and to state universities for for but five hundred dollars a year, so they were the ones who were driving the fancy cars, and I was I was driving a fancy car, but it wasn't mine; it was my father's, hmm. and there were certain restrictions, of course, that came with. So, so speaking speaking of cars, let's let's fast forward. I know Stosh has got uh, a new topic burning on his mind here. What's that? The, the what's I, what's I'm... that with the resorts world? Yeah, so the, oh, the yeah. whole new resorts world that uh, is built in Sullivan County. What do you think of that? Excuse me. Uh, it, it's interesting because there were a lot of people who said if gambling would have come to the worst belt, that would have rescued it, and and it, it might have it might have prolonged its existence, but rescued it rescued it. No. So on the on part of the grounds of the former concourse, actually the far end of the golf course, uh, they they built a casino complex that cost $925 million. So to put that in, 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 in its context, back in the day, you could have bought every hotel in the Catskills for $925 million. Yeah. So, so they, they, they built this, it, it 
uh, it's part of Genting, which is a Malaysian uh, gambling and gaming corporation. Uh, there's several resorts worlds around uh, Resorts World at Aqueduct Racetrack Downstate, which is a, a it, it's a racino. We we had that at Monticello Raceway. So the racino didn't have live uh, croupiers dealing the games. You had the uh, you had the video games, uh, and they, they were quite interesting, by the way, because the the video you know you had this 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 nice looking uh, woman and, and that handsome looking guy who would be dealing out, but they were all you know. Like uh, like on Star Trek, there were holograms of sorts dealing this out. The casino, it, it's it. The description about a year or so ago is that it's hemorrhaging money. It was losing a lot of money, and I, I presume it continues to do that. Did it? Did it save the, the what's left of, of the mountains? No, not at all. Did it offer people some jobs that had career paths? Yes. What it did it do anything for for Main Street USA and in, in Monticello particularly? No, not at all. Because much like the the old philosophy of uh, of some resort hotels that 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 said we want to keep you here, the casino works the same way. You get on the bus in in, in Brooklyn, Queens. You get on the bus. You drive up. You go into the bus depot in the casino. You get out. They give you the coupon. They give you the the, the chips. They give you. They give you the food voucher, and you're there for eight hours, ten hours. You get on the bus with it. So, has it done anything to revitalize the downtown areas? No. Has it brought uh, new tourists to the area? Yes, but the tourists are are contained using what used to be called the fortress model. Keep them all in one place. Next to it is a smaller boutique hotel called the Alder. Same idea, because it feeds it for those who don't want to stay in, in, in this this monolith it's, it's a magnificent magnificent complex they can stay at a smaller place and then if you're not interested in gaming a mile or so down the road at the cartwright which is a water park so were all of these things the savior of, of the bush belty catskills no not at all and there are people who will dispute it but but the reality is the, the visitors to these resorts are not not they're not going they're not going to the local businesses to buy buy their things the way the uh, the, the old Bush Belt resorts would, would do. So, you know, if 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 you needed if you came up here and went to a hotel, and I remember this from my father, you know, Saturday mornings he would get in the car and he would drive six miles to Ellenville, and he would take my mother to Brodsky's, which was a a women's clothing store, and and they would buy something and, and that was it. Or I would go. With them, and I would go to uh, to Eddie's Country Fair, which was a little department store, and I would buy something. Uh, so the, the people are going to the casino, and it's a very simple concept. Casinos want you to gamble. You know, they, they, they have all the shops, and that's that's fine, but they want you to gamble. So they're they're going to do what they can to keep you on the premises, at least to call the, the hotel proper the premises. So you know, you're, you're not going to say, oh well, you know, for those of you who are interested in going. To, to Monticello, uh, we have a bus that's going on. No, they don't have that. What I think people were referring to when they say that casino gambling would have would have saved the Borscht Belt is that if every hotel or a large number of hotels were given gaming licenses and and they would have their they would have their quote unquote casinos. And the sidebar to this is that way back in the day. When, uh, when when some of the Jewish gangsters of Murder Incorporated would would vacation up here, uh, they were involved with everything from uh, cigarette vending machines to jukeboxes to pinball machines uh, to slot machines. Uh, so you had gambling as such up here. We had card games that were very very high stakes poker games at at Grand Mountain uh, and at most of the hotels. Not just you know not just nickel and dime poker games you know dollar and five dollar games at a time when this was a lot of money so we had gambling up here and and yet the, the well the people would say well that's not the same as a casino well but what are you doing in a casino you, you, you're going to go into you know you're going to go in and you're going to play poker if if you want to play it on a machine you can play it on a machine at resorts world if you want to play at a table you've got several different levels where they're maximums and if you're a real high roller there's a room upstairs for the high rollers at Grand Mountain, you had the card room. 
And in this section of the card room, you had, you know, you had some friendly games of gin rummy. And in that section of the card room, you had blackjack. And in that corner of the card room, away from everything else, you had the poker games where people were glued and men as well as women were glued to the card table from, from, from sunup to sundown, particularly on weekends, breaking only in, in, in some cases, not in, in most cases, but not in all cases for the show. The only time they broke in all cases was when, you know, quarter to three in the morning when the young lady got up and showed her wares. So I, I think it would have prolonged it, but it would have prolonged it only until only only if it were at the other hotels. And even then, most of these hotels and even the larger ones were mom and pops. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, think about this for a moment. You're mom and pop. And, and I'll... We'll talk about a biggie. We'll talk about Kutcher's, which was a mom and pop hotel through its entire in through its entire existence, as, as were most of them. So now you have a mom and pop hotel, and you now have casino gaming that's regulated by a state gaming commission, where where you're going to have inspectors in every Monday and Tuesday, and people coming in Monday and Tuesday, and all of a sudden mom and pop say, "Oh shit." I have part of my income comes from the cash that I get every day from the coffee shop. But what happens if one of the inspectors says, hey, wait a minute, one of this guy's got all this cash from the coffee shop. So all of a sudden, it was another set of eyes that was closing in. So they would have to change their way of doing business. And I'm jumping all around. In the day, there was something that was called Sullivan County Economy. And it was an economy based upon the money flow through the Borscht Belt hotels. So there was an extension of credit based on handshakes. And at the end of the season, everybody got paid. And, and nobody said, well, you know, you're late 30 and you owe me 2% or 5%. That started to change in, in, in the mid-60s when credit cards came, came into, into being. Now, all of a sudden, hotel owners were, were faced with, with a dilemma. If I don't take this guy's credit card, then he and his family can't come here. But if I take his credit card, then all of a sudden the income becomes reportable. And I, I'm not saying that, that you know, well, gee, every, every operator up here was cheating the government. But there, there was an economy that was based upon cash transactions and handshake transactions. Yeah. So why why the gaming would not be would not have been the savior even if it were at a lot of the hotels is because it's another it's another you know uh, uh big daddy is watching from the outside it's it's another set of eyes and that set of eyes invariably doesn't understand how things operate here yeah and what kept the borscht belt as 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 a viable and more than viable uh, destination for, for zillions of people from 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 one end of the the twentieth century almost till the other. So you're talking about you're talking about almost a hundred years of this working. So when did it when did it fail to work, or when did it start to decline? Uh, people said, "Well, the decline is the decline was due to to air travel and exotic vacations and all of this crap." Yeah, except that's only part of it. The other part of it was generation number three didn't want any part of it, with some exceptions. The overwhelming majority of the mom and pops, the third generation, my generation, wanted no part of it. I did, and 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 my family didn't own a hotel, and, and to this day, the only thing I ever wanted to do with my life was own a resort hotel. I just mm -hmm. liked that kind of existence. Where, you know, I could be the maitre d' in the dining room and all of a sudden, you know, there, there's a problem with the master TV antenna and out of the pocket of my tuxedo, I have a screwdriver and a dress, just something called the trim, which would get a clearer picture. But, but you had that and then you had a whole way in which the world did business started to change. When, you know, in the smaller places, the waiters would routinely, you know, the owner would say, take the, take the house car and go to do so, which was a wholesale distributor, get me a case of grapefruits. So I'd go into do so with the house car, and, and I'd say, you know, uh, Abe needs a case of grapefruits, take it. By 1970-ish or so, 68, 70-ish, all right, let me sign for it, you got to do, you started to have automated things, and you'd, you'd have all, this was pre-computer, but it was still 
different than just take it and I'll write it down on a piece of paper someplace because that's how they did that's how they did business. So so that changed and then finally you had you had an over enforcement of a lot of laws. The fire laws needed to be over enforced because when when the, the hotel owners redid the hotels in the 50s they put old they put new into old. So if you had two old wires that were that were 70 years old well, all right, you know what, we'll wrap some tape around them and connect them to the two new wires. A an example of that was the old Browns Hotel that that was bought at a uh, tax sale, and the person rehabilitated it, made it into a condominium complex, except for the fact that it was an example of the phrase, clean shirt on a dirty body. Everything that you couldn't see was old, and everything that you could see was new. And after a while, you know, the old was old, and it, it, it started to, it started to, to decay to the point where you had where you had a fire, so that part of it was fine. But when when you had food inspectors who would come in and and enforce the law laws that were so ridiculous that you just couldn't get out the four hundred meals that you needed to get out for a lunch, you know, you started to tie the hands of of people who said, "Wait a minute, nobody has died. People died in the Borscht Belt." Because they ate too much of things they shouldn't <laughs> eat. And they ate like it the too borscht fast. Soup. Got it. Like the borscht soup. So somebody who, who who's who's on a, a fat restricted diet, yes, you can have the borscht, but you can't put you can't put two tablespoons of sour cream in it. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's on a salt free diet can't eat herring. Okay. So so people died because of that. Yes, some people died because uh, when they put in the, the elevator shafts, you had fires. Yes, some people did. The overwhelming majority died because of, of what I had just said. So to scroll back to the original question, there was nothing that could have saved it because it, it, was, it was the perfect storm. It was a, a, an attack, uh, and not intentional. It was, just, it was just circumstances. It was an attack on all fronts so you know what's what's the final statement you scroll and segue into this this myth called jewish lightning that and and and, and the uh the other week uh one of the oldest buildings at the neville uh caught fire and burnt down and of course jewish lightning no there was no jewish lightning and, and I'll, I'll tell you why one because the 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 owner of that property is is the person who we bought the the uh, uh museum building from in Ellenville, and two, there would have been nothing to be gained by doing this. This was an old, decaying building that was 100 years old that had been retrofitted four or five times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you close a hotel down for the winter, if you close a house down for the winter, and you don't do it the right way, it's a recipe for disaster. Yep. If you have people in the hotel, and it's a cold day, and you, you've got you've got circuit breakers and fuse boxes, and all of a sudden everybody plugs in their electric heater at one time. The wires are going to heat up, and hopefully the fuses or the breakers are going to pop. And if they don't, you have a fire. Were there some fires that 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 were purposely set? Yes, and, and I'm not going to mention the names. I know which ones were purposely so and, set. So, and and Peter, I think this is a good point because I I feel you're trending towards revealing where Jimmy Hoffa is buried. And we don't want to go yeah. there tonight. I know Stosh wants to wrap things up. We're going to have to bring you back maybe to tell us where Hoffa is buried and the facts and circumstances that brought him there. Um, but I know I've really enjoyed tonight's episode. I do notice that you're wearing the Borscht Belt Museum shirt, which is... You make my play for that. Yeah. Uh, the vision of having this went back to 2010 when... Uh, friend of mine and colleague Jack Godfrey had what everybody said was an insane idea. It's been tried for a long time. My, my friend and now board president Andrew Jacobs came on board. We restructured the board. And last April 11th, we closed on 90 Canal Street, which was uh, the Home Savings Bank, which was one of the few banks up here that lent money to, uh, to Jews back in the day. And we, we set it up as a pop-up. Uh, we're in the midst of a capital campaign. To uh, renovate the building, we're reopening this Thursday. We've got Borscht Belt Fest, which this year is going to be a whole weekend uh, there in, in Ellenville. If you go to the site uh, borschtbeltmuseum.org, we've got everything from lectures and as the hotel 
would say to scroll back, Rose Singers has everything, the Borschfeld Museum has everything, and it's a, it's a historical experience because the, the final comment, and, and you can book me because I can go on forever with this because it's my passion. This is more than just a Jewish thing, or in the case of Green County, the Irish or the Italian Alps. This whole thing is a slice of Americana. In, in, in the broadest sense possible, we, we had black help that was unemployable. They came up here and they found employment. We had we had Asian chefs who had no formal experience, but they could cook. Well, they, they found employment up here. You had you had entertainers. You had nice Jewish boys who wanted to earn a buck and get out of the city. You had families who who, who finally found a place where they could, you know, they could they could just lay back and say, "Wow, for eight weeks, I'm in Disneyland without without the lines." Uh, so it, it just an amazing time in Catskill history, let alone American history. Uh, just it, it just blows my mind. So. Once again, uh, Peter, we, we thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, your privilege, pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and letting me ramble on. I yeah, your, your knowledge. Well, we're going to has... send you a bill, Peter. Yeah, you, yeah. You thought, this, you thought this was free? You didn't read the fine print no. in the contract. High five. I, I did. It's like the suggested tip uh, cards <laughs> that we have. But you got to wait until which is Palm Sunday and put in a little manila envelope, you know, and you can. And, just Venmo us the money, Peter. <laughs> high five, big high five. So once again, thank you to the monthly supporters and the monthly sponsors. I really appreciate it. You guys are really uh, helping out the show. Uh, once again, thank you of everyone who is listening to the show. Really appreciate you guys kicking it into 118 episodes. Once again, we have Peter here joining us talking about the Borscht Belt once again, one of the greatest times in Catskill Mountain history uh, and let alone American history that we've had here in uh, our times. And uh, to hear his stuff was absolutely phenomenal. So, uh, Peter, once again, thank you for joining us tonight. Very, very much. And happy hiking. And uh, the snow will melt very quickly. It will. It will definitely. So have a good night, guys. Uh, uh, enjoy everything. And uh, thank you, Peter, once again for joining us. Thanks, My Peter. pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Have a good night, guys. You all too. Thank you. Bye. Hey everyone, I just want to thank you for listening to the show. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe and throw down a smooth review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any podcast platform that you use. You can also check daily updates of the podcast, hikes, hiking news, and local news on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the official website of the show. Remember this. You gotta just keep on living in the cat skills, man. L I V I N. Wicked, 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 wicked.